We are live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the September 15th meeting of the East Hampton Town Board. Carol, would you please read the roll call? Councilman Burke Gonzalez? Present. Councilman Lease? Present. Councilwoman Overby? Here. Councilman Bradman? Here. Supervisor Van Scoya? Present. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic of the United States, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This morning's meeting will begin with the public portion where any member of the public may address the board on any topic. We ask that you please keep your comments to three minutes or less. And we'll be following that with resolutions. The board has four resolutions to approve today. And then a number of topics for work session discussion, beginning with bids, followed by Family Service League presentation of programs and services, community choice aggregation discussion, uh, community preservation water quality uh, requests for applications grant recommendations, outdoor dining pilot program, and uh, while we don't have any uh, specific uh, easement to discuss, uh, we are going to continue the discussion of the South Fork Wind Farm uh, host community benefits and hear from the public on that. That'll be followed by liaison reports. Um, so there is a call-in number on the screen, and uh, we encourage anyone who would like to address the board to give us a call. Let us know your thoughts. Michael, do we have any callers on the line at this time? Yes, we do. I'll be unmuting the first caller in queue right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. My name is Michael Hansen. Good morning, Mike. How are you? Good morning. Uh, as you know, I live right here in Wainscott. I live here full time year round, and I have a comment about Beach Lane. The opposition to the wind farm suggests that uh, Wainscott is not the best available site to run an underground transmission cable to the substation at Cove Hollow. The opposition says that the decision as to where to land the cable should be based on the merits. They also suggest that the town is somehow not following the rule of law. In my opinion, if the New York Department of Public Service, the Department of State, the Department of Transportation, all the departments, every one of them, come back and say, yes, Beach Lane in Wayne Scott is best, optimal, least disruptive site for an underground transmission cable, and we base this decision on the merits, opposition will still say no. They will continue to say no. And just a, a final point, the transmission cable distance in Wayne Scott will not be 4.1 miles. 4.1 is the entire distance to the substation at Cove Hollow, but Cove Hollow is in East Hampton. The distance of the transmission cable in Wayne Scott, the entire distance is 3.26 miles. This is what they are trying to stop. By comparison, the distance of the water mains that were installed in Wayne Scott last year were 8.5 miles, nearly three times as long. And I didn't hear one protest about that. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling in, Michael. Do we have any other callers on the line? Yes, we do. I'll be unmuting the next caller in the line right now. Hello, caller. You're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Yeah, just to make a point good morning. to what the... Could you please, excuse me. Could you please identify yourself for the record? And good morning. Oh, sure. My name is Jordan Tarama. And just, just to make a point that uh, the other men, gentleman who just called in said... There was no complaints about Wayne Scott for water lines. There's a huge difference between water lines and electricity being put underground, as well as electricity being put under the beach, which we all know when you look at what happened in Block Island, you had the huge electric line coming out of the water that kids were actually playing on. 
So please don't embarrass yourself by making a point that water lines are the same as uh, hundreds of thousands of volts being pumped under the ground. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time to call in, Jordan. Do we have any other callers on the line? Yes, we do. I'll be unmuting the next caller in queue right now. Hi, this is uh, Lance Gottko of the law firm Friedman, Kaplan, Seiler, and Edelman. We represent Citizens for the Preservation of Wayne Scott. Um, so obviously my, 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 my comments relate to uh, the Deepwater Project. Are they, uh, is this the appropriate time or uh, at the time that the topic comes up under the topic uh, agenda? No, this, this would be an appropriate time, Lance, if you'd like to make comments. And again, we ask that you try to keep them to three minutes. Right, so in order to do that, um, I, I, I'm just going to refer to the letter that we sent to the town board uh, earlier this morning. Um, I just want to touch on a couple points in the letter. I'm not going to uh, restate the entire letter, obviously, because it's quite detailed. One, um, the, the, uh, the community benefits agreement that was posted on the town's website is incomplete. It does not include the easement agreement. It doesn't include the trustee. Uh, easement agreement. Um, council for the town uh, at the last working session said that all those agreements are are intimately intertwined. So it's difficult for uh, anyone to uh, cogently assess the project if we don't have all the agreements. And we would ask that the entire uh, community benefit agreement with its exhibits uh, be made public. And Lance, um, we uh, second, intend to do so. Yeah, just if I could address that point before you move on. Uh, we certainly will do so once those uh, agreements are ready to be released and finalized. And we expect that'll be soon. Okay, great. Um, uh, secondly, just to address the, 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 the main points so the people who may be on the line can, can hear what the basis of uh, the basic what we said in the letter is that when when actions such as granting an easement uh, uh, by the town uh, such as this are taken, it's absolutely required that an environmental review be undertaken before the action is taken, before any vote is taken to approve something of this sort. In this instance, because of the nature of the project, the environmental review is going to take place at the PSC level during the Article uh, 7 proceeding. But, and we cite law in our letter to this effect, that doesn't um, give the town license to proceed to act and approve uh, the grant of an easement unless and until that environmental review is completed. And the fact that the easement is in part contingent on PSC approval changes nothing here because as Council for the Town explained um, at, at the last working session, the agreement fixes the legal obligations uh, and rights of the parties only subject to the, uh, the PSC ultimately uh, approving the project. So the town is, is about to take action that fixes its legal rights and obligations with respect to this project and cannot do so unless and until the environmental review is completed at the PSC level. That's our point. When we would ask that our letter, uh, because obviously of the limited time here, be made a part of the record today, uh, so that our so that um, anyone who wants to see and understand our, our full position uh, can do so. Thank you, Lance. I think it's a rather novel approach um, legally to suggest that a property owner or proprietor cannot engage in a legal contract with another party developer or otherwise ahead of a full environmental review, whether it be CEQA or PSC. Um, that would certainly turn on head uh, many years of experience of 
those who uh, are contract vendees on a property for development and enter into contracts that require uh, something take place contingent upon the completion, successful completion of environmental review. But we'll certainly take a look at it. We'll have our, uh, our legal experts review uh, your position and we appreciate you taking the time to contact us today. Thank you very much. We have another caller on the line, Michael? Yes, yes we do. I'll unmute the next caller in queue right now. Uh, good morning. This is David Gruber. I live in Hard Scrabble. Um, morning, David. Into the host community. Good morning. How are you all? Uh, well, thank you. Into the, you, probably, you probably thought I vanished. Uh, just, just COVID related. Um, so let me let me begin in order not to take too much of the time. Uh, entering into the host community agreement before the Public Service Commission has issued the Deepwater Wind Project a certificate of environmental compatibility and public need under Article 7 of the Public Service Law would be in violation of your legal duty under the State Environmental Quality Review Act, SECRA unless that is you first complete the required environmental review process yourself. You clearly have no intention of doing so. An agency such as this board may not take any defined action under CEQA without first completing CEQA compliance. An action is defined to include, quote, any agency planning and policy-making activities that may affect the environment and commit the agency to a definite course of future decisions. End quote. Entering into a bonding agreement to grant easements, even adopting a resolution to that effect, would without question be such an action. It does not matter whatsoever that the agreement is in part stated to be contingent on PSC approval. The law is clear that there is no secret exemption for binding commitments that are subject to contingencies. And to the supervisor's point, uh, SECRA only binds state agencies. Any private party is completely free to enter into a contingent agreement that's contingent upon environmental process. A state agency is not. Moreover, the contract contingency protects the applicant, not the town. If the project is not approved by the PSC, there will be no easements with or without the agreement because there will be no project. If the PSC approves, the town would be bound committed to a definite course of future decisions. That is precisely what the agreement is intended to do for the benefit of the applicant, not the town. You perhaps imagine that the action you propose to take, entering into an agreement before the PSC acts, is exempt under SECRA, a defined type two action. Not so. The relevant exemption, number 44, applies to quote, actions requiring a certificate of environmental compatibility and public need under Article 7, 8, 10, or 10 of the Public Service Law and the consideration of granting or denial of any such certificate. It is quite simple. If your action does not require a PSC certificate, you may not act without secret compliance. If your action does require a PSC certificate, and so would be exempt, you cannot act now because there is no required PSC certificate and cannot be until the PSC concludes its work. The basic scheme of New York's environmental laws is clear. No government action before completion of environmental compliance. That includes you. Two years ago and more, you made an illegal deal behind closed doors for a beach lane route for the cable before the applicant had even filed with the PSC. You justified it by claiming that it was contingent on PSC approval. When the public pushed back, you first denied making a deal and then publicly declared that you would not do so until environmental compliance had been completed. That compliance has just begun. The PSC has not even begun to hold hearings on the matter. Yet here you are again, proposing to do what was illegal then what is still illegal now, and what you told the public you would not do. The Deepwater Project is little more than a fraud on the public. It will not do what its local advocates claim. 
delivering power to 70,000 South Fork homes because electricity does not work that way. Once connected to the grid, the power is delivered to the entire LIPA ratepayer base. That is why the entire LIPA ratepayer base will be paying its grossly excessive cost, three to four times the going rate for wind power. The project will not meet the peak demand on the South Fork, its so-called purpose, because wind in this area is an intermittent source that will inevitably deliver no power for periods of time that exceed battery storage capacity. Its peak output would be in the winter, when demand on the South Fork, South Fork is slack. Its slack output would be in the summer, when demand on the South Fork is at peak. For that reason, transmission between View Lane and the Canal and Riverhead substations must be upgraded, if it has not been already, so that the full rated output of the project can go either way. Once transmission is upgraded, this project is superfluous in terms of South Fork peak demand. The project cannot even meet the stated purpose of the LIPA RFP to defer such transmission upgrades until 2022, as the project will likely not even have begun by then. The project is also only one-third the size that the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority says is the minimum efficient size which is why it is grossly overpriced. As the power is destined for the entire grid, the technically obvious solution is to bundle the transmission with that of the adjacent wind power fields for delivery to the grid mid-island where it is technically optimal. The only reason the cable is to be landed in East Hampton is so that LIPA and Deepwater can pretend that the project addresses South Fork peak demand when it is obvious that as a technical matter, that is impossible. A major purpose of secret is to prevent projects being undertaken based on falsehoods. That is why action is forbidden until environmental compliance is complete, so that the facts can be known before there is any binding commitment. It is ironic, to say the least, that those who advocate for this project claiming to champion the environment cannot move fast enough to violate the environmental protection laws. Thank you. Thank you uh, for taking the time, David. And um, I, I am going to just say that your characterization of how the board has acted is misleading and false. We never made any agreement with deep water. Uh, to date, we still have not signed an agreement or made agreement with deep water. And we're continuing the process. My comments to the uh, earlier caller also extend to your comments. And um, I'm kind of not surprised that you would turn up at this point uh, to level such charges against your former opponent for the supervisor's race. But beyond that, uh, we do thank you for making your comments known. And we'll take the next caller, please. I said the same thing two years ago. Thank you. Yes, we, we know that. And we know what the public's response was as well. Can we take the next caller now, please? Yes, Mr. Supervisor, I'll be unmuting that caller right now. Hello, caller, you're live with the town board. Hello, caller, are you there? Hearing none, Mr. Supervisor, I'll move on to the next caller. Hello? Hello, caller, you're live with the town board. Could you please state your name? Thank you very much. My name is Steve Marzo. I'm a resident of Amagansett. I'm calling in respect of the proposed emergency medical facility. I listened to Mr. Whitmore's comments at the meeting of September 3rd, and I found myself in agreement 100%. It's, it's, it's inconceivable for me to think that we could not find another location other than this one. I thought his commentary was quite thoughtful in thinking about some of the impact of this proposed site on both the children's athletic facilities, on the traffic congestion, and I don't even think the relevance of existing medical facilities really has much of a case here since this facility is and will be over time much more substantial in size and scale as a reflection 
of the acute need for such facilities in the, uh, in the, in the community. I recognize that the board, as explained by Supervisor Van Skoyak uh, a few weeks ago, has looked at alternative sites in the past. I, I still think, along with um, Mr. Whitmore, that a, additional work needs to be done. I'm not very happy with this location at all. And I can tell you that as members of the community, and the level is, of, is increasing of those who, while recognizing the overwhelming need for the facility, find its location to be problematic. My second commentary, also in respect of the medical facility, is in the commentary that I've heard and read from Councilman Mr. Bragman. I find that his commentary is with respect to the need for a more comprehensive and detailed analysis of the traffic impact are appropriate. Uh, the attention to the required parking facilities now and in the future should be reviewed as well. And I would urge other members of the board to consider his recommendations seriously. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Steve. I just I just want to add that the committee looked at 30 properties within the township prior to making their determination, and that committee included a number of folks that were involved with the Little League board and uh, stakeholders within the community. But we appreciate you taking the time to make the comments now. Thank you. Michael, do we have any other callers in the line? Yes, we do. I'll be unmuting the next caller in queue right now. Hello, caller. You're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Hello, caller. Are you there? Hearing nothing, Mr. Supervisor, I'll move on to the ne next caller in queue. Hello, caller. You're live with the Town Board of East Hampton. Hello, caller. Are you there? Hearing nothing, again, I'll move on to the next caller. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, caller, Morning. you're live with the two board. Morning. 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 Please turn Morning. down, Hello? Please Hello? Turn Hello? down Hello? your Hello? background speaker in the background, please. background, please. background, please. background please. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, okay. Can you hear me Can now? Can you hear me now? I'm um, still oh, echoing, 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 echoing. echoing. You must turn off you, the speaker. You must turn in off the room, speaker room, in your room. Your room. Your room. Your room. Turn off what? 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 All I have on is my phone. My phone. My phone. My phone. Yeah. 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 Um. 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 Phone on speaker. Phone on speaker. 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 Oh. Oh. No. Oh. No. Oh. No. 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 That doesn't help you. Help you. Help you. Okay, well, okay, I will well, just I say, will, say, say, will, say, say, say that I that am I calling in support, support of the $29 million, 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 million. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Supervisor. I just had to mute her for one moment because clearly that's unhearable. Um, yeah. Ma'am, if we'll you We'll ask the caller to please try calling back for a better connection. Yes. It sounded uh, like they were saying they were in favor of the host community benefits package. Correct. And if, uh, if the caller can hear me, this is the technician from LTV. When you call in or anyone calls in, you have to have the audio off in the room that you're in if it's on television or on a computer as well. Uh, Mr. Supervisor, would you like me to open that line back up for a moment? Sure. Let's try again. Okay. One moment. Hello, ma'am. Are you there? Hello, caller. Okay. Well, hearing nothing, I do have a few more calls. I can move on if you'd like, Mr. Supervisor. And if that person is listening, uh, please try your call again. And again, that's good advice that Michael's given that please turn off the audio on any device that you might be watching the meeting on when you call in to avoid that feedback loop. Okay. I'm going to unmute the next caller in queue. Hello, caller. You're live with the town board. Hello, caller. Are you there? 
Hearing nothing, I do have a few more callers. I'll move on to the next caller. Hello? Hello. Hello, good can morning. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank oh, you. yes. Good morning. This is Carolyn Logan Gluck calling from Wayne Scott. Hi, good morning, Carolyn. How are you today? Very well, thanks. I have um, uh, two questions. One is a question that I'm asking on behalf of a Wayne Scott citizen who was not free to call in this morning. Um, uh, the question had to do with the um, changes to the community benefits uh, agreement, uh, the one that had been published in uh, uh, April of 2018, um, specified uh, benefits that would be directed specifically to Wayne Scott. Um, and it looks in what we've seen of the draft HCA that um, those are no longer um, being specified. Do you have any thoughts on, uh, beyond what you've said, that um, uh, payments should be directed in ways that would benefit the community and public health? Do you have any further thoughts on the subject of how community benefits would be directed? Well, I think that's really a, a discussion for the board, and it's up to the board to decide. I, I gave my own personal opinion uh, that I think uh, at least a portion of, of these payments should go towards projects that improve the environment, improve our sustainability and resiliency as a community, uh, and potentially also improve public health. Uh, but each board member will have their own opinion and we'll have to have discussions about how uh, that money would be allocated. Uh, I'm opposed to using those funds in the general fund uh, to balance a budget or to make up for budget shortfalls. I think that it should be in a dedicated fund for sp specific enumerated uh, causes. That's my own personal opinion. Again, that's a board decision. Terrific. Well, that's good to hear. Um, the second uh, uh, thing I wanted to say is really a comment. Um, given that the um, exhibits A, B, and C were not included in what you um, made public, um, I would urge you um, to be as transparent as possible and to make it known when those exhibits and when the rest of the uh, draft host community agreement um, is made available to the public. Um, just because you're not hearing from people doesn't mean that they necessarily agree and doesn't mean that they don't necessarily want to ask questions and share some of their viewpoints. So um, transparency and opportunities um, for comment and question, regardless of whether or not a public hearing is required, um, is something that I would urge you um, to reach for. Yeah, I appreciate that comment very much, Carolyn. And you know, part of what we're trying to do, and the reason that the other attachments aren't aren't uh, released yet, is because we haven't finalized them, but. Uh, just so the public had the greatest amount of time to start reviewing and discussing this, I thought it was appropriate to release it as soon as we had uh, really kind of come up with the final draft on the host community benefits portion. Uh, again, we'll make the other documents available as soon as they're ready to be released. And, and I had hoped that they might be ready today uh, but they are not. So that's why I had scheduled the South Fork Wind Farm as a discussion item today. Uh, again, as soon as we have those documents, we'll have a discussion about them and post them for the public. Well, um, seeing as you did release what you did, there was one little phrase that caught my eye um, in sections 3.1 and 3.2, which said portions of the cable. That sounded quite vague to me, and I was wondering uh, why that um, qualifier was in there rather than necessarily the entire cable would be constructed, operated, maintained, repaired, and removed. Yeah, I think it has to do with the fact that the entire cable uh, is 30 some miles long, and uh, this doesn't address the portion beyond our jurisdiction. 
I see. So you would remove all parts of the cable that were under, or you would have the developer remove all parts of the cables that were under your jurisdiction when the project was decommissioned? Yeah, we thought that it was important to have that in place. Um, you know, conceivably, the PSC could not, might not have that requirement uh, as a condition, and we felt that this was something that really should be addressed, and we wanted to ensure that we had some leverage and control over that because we think that's an important aspect of the project. Terrific. All right, well, that's it for this morning, um, but I look okay. forward to um, other opportunities for questions and comments on this in the future. We'll, we'll certainly make that uh, available. But, so thank again, thank you, thank you for you. taking the time to call in today, Carolyn. Michael, do we have any other callers in the yes, queue? We do. Yes, we do. I'll be unmuting the next caller in queue right now. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, we can. Oh, that's great. So this is Francesca Rhiannon, um, and I'm just calling in to support the $29 million package in benefits, which I think is an extraordinary amount that the town can really use at this point to help to increase the, our ability to transition to a clean energy economy. Uh, more than just offshore wind, the town can use this money for very important, um, very important initiatives. Uh, it could be used to help in uh, in in allowing us to um, make the town more of a climate smart community. I think, as we all can see, that things are really uh, very seriously out of whack with the climate, as we see from the fires in California, and um, that we here are not going to escape these effects. So I'm really heartened by it. Now, one question I, ha I have to ask about this is, will some of this money be used to bury the power line so that in the event of a hurricane, which you know, sooner or later is going to happen here, our power uh, lines will be more protected. That certainly could be something mm -hmm. taken into consideration. Again, I've expressed what my view is on that. I think trying to foster uh, and bolster uh, more resiliency and sustainability within our community is really important. Again, that's a board discussion as to how um, those funds would be dedicated. I do think they should be dedicated and not just uh, supplement the general fund. Yeah, so I would just like to urge that as much as possible, these funds be used in our climate emergency for the town of East Hampton to uh, really boost, not, not just the town, but to also help residents make the transition to clean energy, whether that means providing, uh, you know, help to uh, people who are lower income and being able to get solar panels, whether it means developing plans for microgrids so that we can boost our resiliency um, in, in town. I mean, there are many ways that we could use this money. Of course, it's limited, but it, that it could be used to promote and leverage uh, a swifter transition to a more climate resilient community in this climate emergency. So I, I completely support this. I also am glad that some of the money is going to help the fishermen um, because they're going to really get uh, hit very, very hard, not by offshore wind power, that's not going to be a problem for them, but by the inevitable rise in, uh, in, in, in ocean temperatures is going to have a huge impact on our fishing industry. And so it will be welcome to have some funds available to help fishermen in this climate emergency. And, and that, that's all, I'll just take the rest off the air. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. We have another caller waiting. So Mr. Supervisor, at this time, we have a few calls that I had opened before that were no one there. They're still holding on. If you want, I can go through them again or- yeah, try going through anyone who's holding on the line. Thank you. One moment.
Hello, caller. You're live with the town board. Hello, Hello, caller. I'm just calling to listen in. I'm sorry? Um, I'm just calling to, to listen in. Okay, fair enough. I'll move on to the next caller. Hello, caller. You're live with the town board. Hi there, this is Mike Mahoney. Hi, good morning, Mike. Good morning, Peter. Last uh, week when I called in, by the way, when we were talking, I spoke and then you rebutted, and I was muted again, so I could never respond back to you. I hope that doesn't happen this time. I know it's not easy being far apart. Um, with the HCH agreement that you're referring to, uh, I made a statement, and you corrected me, that your understanding was a little bit different, but I'm reading from a February 18th East Hampton Star article that stated the East Hampton Town Board will also have to vote to grant the easement, but the board supervisor, Peter Van Soyek, has indicated the body likely wouldn't move forward until the state finishes its review and comes to a decision. That's just from there. The money at almost $29 million is an inducement, no matter how you want to try to say it, for the town to sign off on Beach Lane. There are other viable alternative sites that are going to be evaluated, but you're specifically putting it into that HCH agreement that it requires the landing at Beach Lane. And I would, I'm not an attorney, you know, you do have an attorney on the board that gave his thoughts, uh, and I would encourage you to speak with your attorneys, point out that you're going to be better served with an agreement for the HCH that doesn't state the landing of the cable at Beach Lane, but just landing it in East Hampton gives you more flexibility. In addition to that, that's an awful lot of money, which... You know, it's a wonderful thing for the town to be able to have. It's coming from a company that's causing a significant increase to ratepayers. Now, for us rich millionaires, or whatever you want to call us, that keeps getting thrown in our face at Beach Lane, we can certainly absorb a higher electric bill, and we'll be happy to pay it if it helps improve the CO2 emissions in, throughout the area. There's never been any study, though, to see what the net impact will be on CO2 emissions. And I believe one should be done, because in speaking with PSE&G and LIPA, they have indicated to me they have no intentions of shutting down their generators. Just hopefully someday we'll get additional batteries back up in other forms that they would be able to. The thing that I would state while some people will be able to gladly absorb that increased electric bill, there's a lot in the community that won't, whether they're single parents or just young people. Look at all of the people that have been devastated by this COVID, have lost employment, have no forms of income coming in other than state aid or federal aid. That money should all be earmarked, I think, to take it out of the equation that it's uh, a payoff, that it's there for the benefit of those who can't uh, really afford another substantial increase in cost. I wanted to state all of that, and I sincerely hope that this board does not pursue signing this HCH agreement prior to the Article 7 review. It's been indicated to me that it's being done possibly as an incentive to lock up Beach, Land, Beach Lane as a landing site. I can assure you, we will, those of us that oppose this, fight to ensure that alternatives are made available and that deep water Orsted thoroughly evaluates all of the landing sites. This is not the shortest cable route on land to the Cove Hollow substation. If you look at a map, you can clearly see other ones, let alone the advantages of other sites. Um, I, I just have to say this, 
I strongly encourage it. Peter, I know you think that you've been personally attacked. That has never been the intent of me, at least, and others that I know of. We are grateful for what the town board has done for Wayne Scott. You served on the CAC committee a long time ago. You've been very good about showing up and listening to us. But it's the actions that speak. It's not the lip service. Thank you. I have nothing else to say. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate you taking the time to address this again. All righty. Let's see what you do. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Do we have any other callers on the line? Yes, we do, Mr. Supervisor. I'll be unmuting the next caller in queue right now. Hello, caller. You're live with the town board. I live in... Hello, caller. Hello, Mike. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Good morning. We can hear you fine. Good morning. Okay, great. Who's calling, I am all in... I'm sorry? Who's calling, please? Your name, oh, please? Oh, my name... My name is Deva Sobel. I live in the Springs. Oh, hey, Deva. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Good. Thanks for taking my call. I uh, am all in favor of the wind project. I've, I've put, uh, by your example, I've put solar panels on my own roof and uh, feel that we all need to do whatever we can to address the, the climate situation. So... I, I salute you and wish you well on this. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to hear that you've taken advantage of the town solarized program. And uh, yeah. you know, everything we can do, we should do at this point. We're, we're really headed for a terrible crisis if we don't. Ava, I just want to interject that I'm very much in favor of your books and have enjoyed them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> How nice of you. Thank you. And thanks so much for taking the time to call us and let us know your thoughts. I appreciate that. Okay, I felt it was really important. Bye now. Bye-bye. Be well. Any other callers on the line? Yes, there are a few other callers in queue, Mr. Supervisor, a few of which who have um, spoken already that are still on if you want them to speak again, and the other few have had no signal when we've tried them. I see. Yeah, at this point, uh, before we go a second round with any callers, I'd, I'd like to move on and do the resolutions that we have in front of us. And then we can uh, move on with our agenda. Uh, if there are callers that wish to speak later, we'll give an opportunity to do so. Um, the first resolution is mine. It's uh, resolution 2020-859. I'd like to read the entire thing. I think it's important. Um, so please bear with me. This is to adopt the negative declaration change in the zoning district designation 400 Panago Road, East Hampton, New York from Parks and Conservation PC to Commercial Industrial CI. Whereas the town of East Hampton is the owner of property at 400 Panago Road, East Hampton described on the Suffolk County tax map as 300-165 uh, 0005.00-022000, uh, the subject premises, whereas the town board by resolution in 2016, uh, resolution 1482 designated the subject premises as a preferred site for a freestanding emergency department to be developed by Southampton Hospital. And whereas the town in 2018 approved a lease of the subject premises to Southampton Hospital for the possible construction of a freestanding emergency room by resolution 2018-144. And whereas based upon the use of the premises by the town for two ball fields and a comfort station, the zoning classification on the property had been previously changed from a residence with affordable housing overlay to parks and conservation. And whereas in connection with the lease of the subject premises, the town board sought the approval of the New York State Legislature for the alienation of parkland since the premises has been used as a little league field, although having been designated as an affordable housing site 
And whereas by bill number A-8100, Senate Bill 6291, the New York State Legislature approved the alienation of parkland for purposes of the establishment of an emergency room subject to the town's compliance with certain conditions, those being that the town dedicates an amount equal to or greater than the fair market value of the release property towards acquisition of new parklands and or special improvements to existing parklands and recreational facilities. And whereas the town board is considering a change in the zoning designation of the subject premises from parks and conservation to commercial industrial, a designation the subject premises held until its amendment to a residence and then PC. And whereas two neighboring properties at 300 Panago Place and 200 Panago Place are currently designated as commercial industrial. And whereas the proposed project is a type one action pursuant to the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act known as CECRA and chapter 128 Environmental Quality Review of the Town Code and the town desire to perform a coordinated review of the application with the involved agencies and act as lead agency as it is the agency most familiar with the proposed project and has the capacity to provide a thorough environmental assessment of this action through the town's planning department. And whereas the town board made a legal agency, um, sorry, made a lead agency designation and sent notice of the same to all involved agencies and such designation was not objected to by other involved agencies. And whereas the planning department on behalf of the town board prepared an environmental assessment form and the town board has reviewed the same in a manner consistent with the requirements of six NYCRR part 617, section 617.7B and hereby adopts the EAF including parts two and three as written, now therefore be it resolved that the town board hereby issues a negative declaration pursuant to the provisions of CECRA and chapter 128 of the East Hampton Town Code. Do you have a second? Second. Can I have discussion, please? Greg, would like to have discussion, please continue. Um, I, uh, I'm a little concerned about this resolution and I wanna to try to make it as clear as possible so that uh, even people that don't understand environmental review can, can follow along. Um, the resolution is captioned as if we are merely um, saying that the change of zone would not cause any adverse environmental impacts. Uh, as I understand it from talking to our town attorney, um, that is not all that this resolution does. This resolution is effectively a statement that the proposed medical facility at 400 Pandago will cause no adverse environmental impact. So this is a, this is a concluding statement about the entire project, not merely the rezoning. Um, I wanna say that um, I support a medical facility at this location. Um, at the same time, I think that the planning that goes into it has to be thoughtful and deliberative um, and uh, as searching uh, as the size of the project and its potential impacts um, suggest may happen. And I don't think that's the kind of review that we're giving this. The application was started with an application to the planning board for site plan special permit review. I believe it's only been heard one night at the planning board. It might be that it was heard two times, but my understanding was that it was heard once. And there was some discussion about um, the need for a traffic light and or a traffic circle in front of the Panago Place location because of the intensity of traffic. So the decision-making here um, involves a site plan and a special permit application that technically is still pending in front of the planning board. And what the town board is today doing is it is shortcutting and I would say short circuiting the process because we are making the decision that there are no environmental impacts. Now, I believe 
that nonetheless, the, the town board intends to send this to the planning board for further review, but that's a contradiction in terms. Um, you don't reach your conclusion that there are no environmental impacts and then turn it over to the planning board and say, take a look at the site plan and the special permit requirements and make a decision because you've essentially, uh, you've rendered the planning board somewhat toothless in the review because you've already announced the decision. Um, I've said that we are racing to a conclusion here at the request of the applicant. And I know that's true because I've spoken to the applicant's attorney um, and September 15th was the deadline that they preferred to conclude CICRA. Um, and the people watching this may remember that last week, a half an hour before our meeting began, um, we received a traffic report um, on the uh, uh, impacts from Dunn Engineering. We've never obtained any kind of review of that. None of us is a traffic engineer. We don't have anybody in the planning department that's a traffic engineer. So we've essentially just accepted the Dunn Engineering report without question. And I would say that that is not what the law requires and they use a very common sense term in a case like this they say that we are obligated to take a hard look at an application in addition i want to get technical for a minute this is uh categorized um as the most serious kind of actions that we review under the state environmental law it's called a type one action and because it's a type one action the standard to require uh, an impact statement, which is a more detailed evaluation of a, an impact, is very, it's very low. You don't, you don't have to prove an impact may occur. The standard is if an impact may occur, if it's possible, then you must do an impact statement. Um, and in contrast, when a board comes to a decision that there will be no impacts, that's a higher burden of proof because we have to have evidence that shows definitively that there will be no in impacts. We, we haven't met that standard. We haven't reviewed the traffic issue here. And it's an issue that has been raised before in duly adopted long range planning of the town of East Hampton. Our Hamlet uh, report for East Hampton at page 50 contains recommendations for access management to help reduce traffic congestion because of uh, inefficient turning movements along the corridor near Pantago Place. And the, our Hamlet study plan um, suggests uh, potential parking lot linkages. And it also says that uh, we might consider a shared parking ordinance, but significantly it explicitly notes that we might be looking at a medical facility on, on the property and that that would provide an opportunity a, a, a timely opportunity for potential state uh, and private funding avenues to develop an access management plan connecting the area's commercial and municipal facilities. What that's saying is that we long ago recognized that traffic is a problem. And anybody uh, knows that who's driven on that road at four or five o'clock in the summer season going westbound. It's, it's jammed. It's, it's often bumper to bumper. And Page 53 of the East Hampton Hamlet report contains a spreadsheet for implementation of these suggestions, including a that we commission a study by re the responsible parties, and they specifically name the town board Southampton Hospital um, to examine this. And, and I would suggest that um, given the, the size of this project, uh, and I'm not talking about the ultimate benefit that it may provide to the community, because as I said, and I will repeat, I support a medical facility here. But I think that we have to take some time before we simply make a declaration that there are no negative impacts from this. We need to, we need to do our homework, and we haven't done our homework. And this is connected to the issue of uh, staffing. Um, you may remember in the last meeting, or folks who are watching may remember that I asked. I'm sorry, Jeff. I just, if I could just ask you, how much longer you think you might be? Because, because we're like six, seven minutes in. Are you going to continue much longer? I probably have about. 
I probably have about six or seven more minutes, 10 minutes. I mean, this is my only opportunity to discuss. No, to discuss. it's actually not your only opportunity, Jeff. We, we had a work session on this and we went through the CICRA EAF form question by question. And, and, and you know, I, I understand your point. You've made your point. Uh, unless there's any other point that you really want to make, uh, you're, you're trying to bolster your argument no, I'm, I'm, I don't, not I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me just finish. No, I, I don't want to take the time for you to try to bolster your argument. You've made your point. We've heard your point. We understand your point. And I think, frankly, we disagree with your points. So I'd at, like to continue. Point, I don't, rather, I don't than, think... rather than just drag this out, I'd, I'd like to take it to a vote. Um, and, you know, you certainly could submit in writing whatever you like. But no, I, I want to say this to the public here. I, I'm sorry. You've made that point to the public on numerous occasions. No, I, I have gotten actually, yeah, I, I'm sorry, Jeff. You know, I'd well, like to I have gotten answers. I've gotten, and, I, as, as you know, I, I'm the only one that submitted written questions to the applicant. I've gotten some answers on those questions. Yes, and, we, and we've read all those answers. And well, I'm, the public I'm, doesn't I, know anything the letter, about it. The and response I have, letter is, you know, Submitted for the record, you know. Peter, we're taking those. more time now for you to try to cut me off than to give me the six minutes to piece of paper. Yeah. I can wrap this up fairly quickly. Okay, please Thank do. You. Thank you. Um, the, 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 the applicant has said they're going to have uh, a standard. Of, of, you're going to do the whole. Carol, I. Go ahead. She I'm muted. Yeah, I'm I muted, Carol. Sorry, everybody. Sorry about that, Carol. Um, the, the uh, applicant has indicated that this building, which has 24,000 square feet, is going to be staffed at maximum capacity with only 14 employees. I find that difficult to believe, given the size of, given the fact that it's two facilities. One is an imaging center. One is an emergency care center. Each of them has waiting rooms for 20 people. And in addition, we had some discussion about staffing in the event of stroke. And they've indicated that they are going to be prepared to do uh, administer drug busting uh, stroke medications. Well, I looked up the requirements for a facility that can do that. They're called primary stroke facilities under New York state law. And they have a host of requirements. And they're all most, not most, all of the primary stroke facilities in the state of New York that I could locate are hospital facilities. And some of the staffing includes uh, a separate designated Jeff, stroke I, I, ICU. You've, you've made, I'm sorry, you've made all these points before. Uh, this, no, 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 I'm talking make, this, about staffing, Jeff, Peter. No, we I'm talked about, about staffing. staffing. We talked all about staffing, Jeff. We, we got the answers from the hospital. We, did, we all did our homework. It's clear you, you object to this and you're going to vote no. Let's just move the vote, please. So all in favor? Uh, let's have a roll call. Roll call. Let me just, we need to do the, the resolution as amended. The title and the first whereas clause should be 400 Panago Place. It says 400 Panago Road. Thank you for that, Kathy. I moved to amend that. As amended. I'll second that, and my, my only my main comment on here is I think this works within the, with the town's goal number 10 of the 2005 comp plan for providing for health care facilities and many other needs of our year-round seasonal population growth, which in the 2005 comp plan was only going to be increasing by stating in those 10 years, 22.2%. So I think a health care facility, facility of this design, the size, and this location is appropriate. Our more recent Hamlet sorry, study no, sorry, explicitly Jeff, refer Jeff, to Jeff, traffic please, study. Please, Jeff, if I may, run the meeting. What? Thank you. Uh, is, are there any other comments from other board members? Mr. Bragman has certainly had an opportunity to make his. No. I, 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 I do. I'm, I'm sorry, Peter. And I, you know, I, I just want to say that this began in 2016, as we stated in the resolution, that, two, we've been guided by the planning department all along the way and that three, we are the lead agency and that the planning board um, will be able to get this just because we're the lead agency doesn't mean that we, um, that the planning board will not do the thorough review as it's required to do just as sometimes the ZBA is the lead agency and the planning board is subject to what the ZBA looks at. 
So this happens all the time. We are not trying to do something nefarious here, which is what I think Mr. Bragman is, is uh, moving forward. Um, at the time that the Hamlet study was done, the, the uh, facility was thought to be about 32,000 square feet. That certainly would have looked at a different type of um, traffic that we're considering now on something that's less than 24, that's, yeah, less than 24,000 square feet. No. So I just think that Mr. Bragman is again throwing up roadblocks to something that is needed, that's necessary in this community. And um, I want to move forward with a yes vote. Any other comment from board members that haven't spoken? I, I, I would, but I, you know, to be um, frank, I would like to hear what Jeff has to say. Um, I think, you know, he has, he's entitled to, to make his statement and in its entirety, we should hear it. And then we all have an opportunity to comment. Mr. Bramman, did you have any other points that you didn't make before? Yes, I do. I'd like to take it a little more slowly. I think it's worth a little bit of a discussion here. <laughs> okay. I mean, this is a big decision, and and I, you know, I, I just and and after very after other, you know, we've made smaller decisions all along the way, right? We, you know, we we studied, you know, different areas where this could be placed. We did resolutions for leases. We did resolutions to extend leases. So this is <laughs> big building. So it's not something that you know came out of left field. And but you know, I'd like to to hear. Yeah, from we've had three iterations of a of a traffic study and you know we did read the traffic study at least most of us did before the meeting um so but please continue jeff right. I, I appreciate um uh, councilman uh Burke gonzalez uh saying that I, she'd like to hear i, I appreciate that um I, I wanted to talk about staffing partly because the the number of 14 seems uh unrealistic in light of the size of the building. It really, if there were only 14 people in the building, they'd need walkie talkies to talk to each other. This building is 24,800 square feet. That's a big building. It's not 9,000 square feet, if my numbers are correct, larger than the home goods store in Wainscott. It's a big building. Also, they're talking about having CT scan, X-ray, sonogram, mammogram, bone density um, diagnostics, which I think are great imaging, great imaging for the community. But each one of those requires a separate staffer to manage. Um, currently, there is overlap in the parking lots from the medical buildings and the adjacent buildings into town hall and, and vice versa. So there's already some indication of parking problems. I was indicating that the, that the size of the building includes this outpatient treatment uh, area, which is separate and apart from the emergency room treatment area. Presumably, they're going to need reception in each of those places. Um, they're going to need attending physicians, uh, nursing staff, uh, cleaning staff, and, and, a, and a variety of other uh, people to make this work. And I think that we're entitled to get um, a realistic uh, total of what the employees are. And the reason that the number of employees and the size of the building is important is because they're the drivers for the parking requirements and they're the drivers um, for traffic impacts on 27. We know uh, from reports in the newspaper that the planning board was considering, did throw out the idea of building a roundabout in front of Panago Place, um, which is indicative of the, of the fact that traffic is, is going to be a problem there. And in fact, ever since 2018, and from the study that I looked at, um, the, the medical facility has fully anticipated that we're going to need a traffic light. And that, that, I'm, that's not a project killing uh, issue. I'm merely saying that we should get a more detailed study of traffic and take our time more than reading a traffic report that came in at 1030 in the morning for an 11 o'clock meeting. That's the only uh, that's, that's the only review we did of it. And, I, and I'm going to say, I, I, frankly, um, although I'm familiar with traffic reports and I've read a lot of them, I'm not an expert in reading a traffic report. And we, sh frankly, 
because traffic is such a major concern in East Hampton, we should hire an independent traffic analysis to go over the Dunn Engineering Report and see what they think and think about what can be done to ameliorate traffic conditions. And that is explicitly mentioned in the East Hampton uh, Hamlet Study Report at page 50 and 53. And it's specifically, and this is, by the way, David Lease, it's much more recent, as you know, than the comprehensive plan. And it specifically mentions the, uh, the suggestion for a medical facility as being an opportunity to undertake a more comprehensive traffic plan. And given the fact that the building itself will take, I believe, if I'm correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, two, year, two years to construct approximately, I don't see any problem with taking a little bit more time to study the traffic before we get into this so that we have a better idea. And that's what the Hamlet study report recommends. And I wanted to talk to you because I was raising an issue about stroke care. And I'm not gonna argue medicine here, um, but what, what, the, what the applicant responded in its, in its response to me was that they intend to be uh, able to inject clot busting drugs. That would make them a primary uh, stroke center. In the state of New York, if you wanna deal with strokes, uh, because they are so time sensitive and they require such a combination of expertise, it's highly regulated in the state of New York. And I looked through the employee staffing for a primary stroke care center, which is the lowest tier of stroke center. And just looking at what's required also suggests that they are grossly understating the number of employees and staffers that they're gonna use. For example, in a primary stroke center, you need a stroke coordinator. That could be uh, an attending physician. They can have a joint role there. But you also need a medical director, you, and you also need uh, backup staff. You need a neurologist. Um, that can be by telemedicine. Um, you need physicians and nurses who are trained in, 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 in stroke uh, techniques. You need physician's assistants. You need um, a diagnostic radiologist. Um, that has and, and these requirements require them to be available 24-7 within 15 minutes. Now, again, that can be done via telemedicine, but that doesn't mean that you can do everything by telemedicine. For example, people that are experiencing, experiencing strokes need to have a visiting speech therapist so that they can do bedside tests 24-7, 15 minutes to get to the, to the medical facility. Um, they also need competent imaging, they recommend, I've mentioned CT scans, they are strongly recommending CAT scans, which are computer uh, tomography angiograph, angiograms, and they also recommend MRAs, which are magnetic resonance angiograms. Um, and those obviously would take extra staffing to do. They also require a dedicated stroke ICU unit. That means that's a, that's a separate designated area for stroke. Um, they also need a quality improvement person so that they can, and that person is called a quality facilitator so that they can evaluate the treatment they're giving and make sure that they get peer review and keep, keep, uh, keep uh, conditions and service up to, up to par. Um, so these additional employees just on the stroke alone um, suggests that 14 is not a realistic number. Also, if you just think about this logically, you know, if they have two or more emergencies going on while they're doing imaging, or they have a stroke and three car accidents around, they're going to have to have nursing staff, they're going to have to have physician's assistants, they're going to have to have more than 14 employees. I, I don't, I think we need to ask them to give us more detailed advice on the number of employees so that we know, because that's what's gonna cause problems in the parking lots. We also have a long range plan to, to build uh, an, an adjacent building on our campus and move people out of the buildings that are over in, uh, in the Pantago Place area. And that should be considered. Um, and I'm not, I'm not offering, the other comments I have is that I asked for specific information about what, what services and rooms were required as opposed to which were add-ons that they had. And, and the answer they gave was kind of a non-answer. They said, we're, we're going to 
we're going to build in accordance with public law section 28. And I looked through it and it really does not detail the answer to that question. So I want to repeat, I am in favor of a medical building. Um, I'm in favor of it. I'm willing to say, based on, you know, the work that the town has done, that I'm, I'm in favor of it in this location. But I, I don't see any reason to be rushing into a negative declaration on the entire project. And contrary, I have to take issue with Sylvia, and I want to just say this as clearly and as calmly as I can. It is very unusual. It is not routine under SECRA to issue a negative declaration, which is the conclusion of all the environmental review before you give it to the board that's gonna be handling the review. That is totally backwards. And I, I also wanna say as calmly as possible that raising these issues of planning, even if they have to be dealt with in a limited environmental impact statement, will not slow this project down and will not stop this project. All they will do is get more community involvement, give us more knowledge. So my suggestion, and, and, I, and I think a slower pace here is also suggested because this is a type one action. The board probably knows that's the most serious category under SECRA. And the law prohibits a board from issuing a negative declaration that says there are no impacts and then imposing conditions. That's not allowed. That's called a conditional negative declaration because if there is the potential for an environmental impact, the reviewing agency must get an impact statement. And it doesn't have to be a 300 page document. It can be very limited. I'm just suggesting, I wanna reiterate, I support a medical facility I, I believe it can work at this location, but I think we should put more time into it. We're entitled under SECRA to take all the time necessary to get all the information we need. I would like to deploy the planning board, have some back and forth communication so that we really know what we're doing and move forward in that way. That's what I'm asking for. So I, I would just like to make a couple comments. And, and I think the, the one thing that I, continue to have problems with is this is an action that the town board has to take. Uh, we're the only entity that can do it to its own chain. And SECRA requires that the environmental review happen as early in the stage of, of the project as possible. And that would be now. So now is the appropriate time. And we are the appropriate agency to be doing this review. And I want to make it extremely clear that the planning board itself has no greater expertise than the town board as the, as the board involved with making the decision. In fact, it's the same entity, the planning department staff, that guide either board with a review of all the pertinent and salient issues surrounding the environmental review. And they worked hard to prepare this as they would, whether it was the planning board or the town board. And in fact, we went through the document line by line, question by question. And, you know, the only, if I understand it correctly, the, the only in potential, and again, it's not just any environmental impact, it's significant environmental impact that has to be identified. And if I understand it, you're saying that the number of uh, employees you feel has been understated in this project, even though the hospital has repeatedly said 14 is the number of staff members that they intend to have on site, that that would cause uh, the underestimate of that number would cause some significant environmental impact. And I, I just, um, I, I'm having a hard time uh, rectifying that in my mind is that first of all, how it would cause a significant environmental impact. And second of all, I think the point here is that because they have to go through full site plan, that a lot of other questions that really are focused on the development of the site plan and issues that might come up takes place, but it takes place before the planning board because this will, although we make it a secret determination about the overall project, the, the way the site functions uh, really is still the purview uh, once we've done our review uh, of the site uh, 
by the planning board. And so that continues. Um, you know, the traffic study, uh, while you have characterized it repeatedly only minutes before, I mean, it was really like an hour and a half before the meeting that we received the updated. And I got it at 9.30. I believe our meeting starts at 11. Uh, was sent to the board. Yeah, I was I, I'm sorry, Jeff. If you could just let me talk for uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, traffic study was the third iteration, I believe. Uh, it was an update. It was amended traffic study that took into account uh, the traffic generated from the proposed project. Um, and it was, it was actually uh, because of the downsizing of the building from, I think, the original proposal was something like 53,000 square feet. It uh, then became 33,000 square feet. And now it's 23,800 square feet. Um, you know, that resulted in, in fewer uh, parking spaces being needed. It resulted in uh, less traffic generated. And um, all the traffic studies came to the same general conclusion. And that is that highway traffic is actually reduced because the travel times uh, from any location in an emergency by ambulance is shortened within the town. Uh, and that the traffic on the highway, uh, which would continue all the way to Southampton, uh, that traffic's alleviated. It's not generating more traffic. Uh, the fact that anybody who's seeking medical care uh, within the town doesn't have to go to the Southampton Hospital, whether it be for emergency purposes or just general health care. And I think Councilwoman Burke Gonzalez uh, made that point very clear at our last meeting as well, that uh, well visits people who, uh, you know, go to medical facility uh, that's more convenient, often head off more serious uh, medical issues because of that convenience. They go, they're seen sooner by doctors. Um, you know, so there's going to be obviously continued review uh, by the planning board um, you know, Jeff, I appreciate the, all the points you've made. I, I don't think uh, many of them are relevant to secret in terms of demonstrating or identifying uh, any uh, significant environmental impacts. Uh, and that's why I frankly am comfortable with making a negative declaration. That hardly means that the review of this project ends. Uh, in fact, it only moves on and gets more intense if the planning board will take this up and review all the minutia of every little uh, part of the site plan. Uh, we've done that ourselves, I think most of us. Um, and again, I'm, I'm comfortable with a negative declaration uh, with regard to this project. And I believe everybody's had an opportunity. To I, I would actually like to speak if I could, you know. Um, so I just, you know, I, you know, Jeff, I've listened intently over the last few work sessions to your comments and um, it's made me dig deeper. And I thank you for that. Uh, I can say that I've, I've done my homework. I'm ready to vote today. Uh, I reached out to folks when I needed clarification for things. For, for instance, you know, there's already uh, mammography in lab and x-rays at 300 Panico Place. Those facilities will just be moving, you know, down the road to 400 Panico Place. So that traffic, that staff is already there. Um, but, I, you know, I looked into this concept of a freestanding emergency department has been around since the 1970s. It was mostly in communities that were rural in, in nature. And what they're finding is that more and more uh, hospitals are turning now to freestanding emergency departments because the need for medical care grows as, you know, all of us age. Um, so as I was preparing today, you know, I actually looked at the, um, the Hamlet study, but I looked at the, the business district plan. And what I, I found in, uh, in one of the summaries was uh, a bullet called the aging of the local population is driven by new residents. During the same period, and they're referring to 2000 to 2015, the population of 55 and above age group increased significantly in the town of East Hampton. Communities such as Montauk and Amagansett have shown noticeable signs of aging. This suggests that older and more established second homeowners have started to grade the population. 
This may have implications on the demands for goods and services that primarily target seniors. It might also translate into increased demand for senior-oriented social services in public amenities. And, and I might suggest now, in hindsight, it should also read, this may have implications on the increased demand for medical care. Uh, and it's worth noting that Montauk and Amagansett have the greatest distance to travel to Sony Brook Southampton Hospital. Uh -huh. I appreciated you sending the letter, Jeff, to uh, the applicant, and we got back, I believe it was a six page, uh, you know, question and answer on what you would pose to them. And I think it's important that uh, the community know what was in that response. Uh, so a freestanding emergency facility here in East Hampton will be a 911 ambulance receiving facility. It'll be available to the public 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days per year. It'll be staffed by a board certified emergency physician. It will have medical and nursing personnel qualified in emergency care, have on-site imaging equipment in labs to aid in proper diagnostic uh, and treatment. And more specifically, it will have a pediatric treatment room, an OBGYN treatment room, a bariatric treatment room, a resuscitation trauma room, ultrasound testing room, ophthalmology room for eye surgeries, two negative pressure rooms, a decon decontamination room, an MRI shielded room, because they are intending to have an MRI in the future, and for diagnostic testing, cardiac monitoring, CT scanner, bone density scanner, mammography, advanced stat lab, outpatient lab, um, and those last three are what's moving from, from 300 Pianico. And it'll be able to provide effective and efficient transfer to a higher level of care if needed. So if you're in agreement that this is the right, we need the medical care in East Hampton, this is the right site, you said. Um, I, I don't understand why you know, we can't move forward with this because our community needs this facility here, uh, no question. Um, and why, you know, we couldn't concurrently be looking at, you know, traffic, uh, you know, assessment and traffic management to see how we could, you know, work with the, the hospital and Panago Place and 300 where uh, we have a number of suites over there for our staff and town hall to come up with a, a better traffic pattern. I mean, sometimes things don't happen all at once. Sometimes things need to get phased in. Um, but, you know, I think that having the, the uh, hospital have this freestanding emergency department and diagnostic uh, testing and imaging, lab draw is something that's critical to this community. And uh, I don't want to see us wait. I think that I know I can personally say I've done my homework. I'm ready to make a negative declaration on CICRA. And, uh, and I look forward to casting that vote. I, I just want one minute, one minute more to, to just say tra tra traffic that you look at um, that's problematic. It's not just the number on the road traveling because the, the road carries so much traffic. It's, it doesn't really... Uh, uh, amount to anything that's going to disturb the heavy flow on Route 27. The traffic that you really look at in a project like this is trip generation. It's the turning in and the turning out. That's the stuff that can be problematic. And I'm not saying that we can't move forward. I would suggest that we, you know, in reality, what you're doing under the law is you're making a decision before you give it to the board that's going to review the site plan and special permit. I'm just saying your neg deck, if that's where you think you're going, your, your decision that there are no impacts, should be held off until they review. Because what, what's going to happen if they look at it and go, oh, well, we think uh, the traffic doesn't work and we want to you know, make the building 5,000 square feet less. The point is you're, you're making your environmental conclusion first before the board examining it looks at the facts. Are you saying the board doesn't have any authority to make certain requirements or conditions of site plan? I'm saying that in a type one action, what you're what you're doing is if you have a type one action, the most serious action, you can't issue a negative you cannot issue a, a conditioned negative declaration. We're not talking about a conditioned negative. That's what you in effect, that's what you would be doing. 
Um, and, the, and the thing is this, Peter, you, you mentioned before that we're the, we're the agency that's the most appropriate to do it. The yeah. fact of the matter is that, that you've, you've declared yourself lead agency. Yeah. That's a done deal. But the town board is not, does not have the broadest jurisdiction over this property. It, the, the, the board that has the broadest jurisdiction to review this is the planning board. We've delegated our site plan yes. review to the planning board. I'm merely suggesting we hold off on a negative declaration until the planning board reviews it. Yeah, I mean, it's a, do it at the it's end. A familiar, it's a familiar it's gonna, approach. It's not going to delay it. It's a familiar approach, Jeff. It's not going to delay it. We use this approach on most projects that we've uh, discussed and entertained. I, I think what's important to know is that we've done a full environmental review under CECRA to reach this declaration. And you're right that You've talked about it twice. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, Peter. I apologize. I confess. I confess. I'm sorry. Go on. I, I really don't want to go on, but I will anyway. Um, okay. Because, and, and, and forgive me before for trying to limit your comments to 10 minutes. Uh, I, thought you, I thought you were trying to filibuster, and we don't have filibusters here at town. Uh, town board, but um, you know that whether your opinion agrees or not, we've done a full environmental review under CEQA to make a, a declaration. We've followed the law, and we've used the same exact staff that we the planning board would use to advise us. And we are the most appropriate agency to do CEQA because, as you often remind everyone. Uh, as early in the process as possible, you need to do a full environmental. So uh, that's what we've done. And uh, the planning board will still have broad jurisdiction over the specifics of the site plan. Uh, and they could impose conditions, absolutely. And they could actually, um, you know, say that uh, they don't want to approve something. Uh, they still have that authority under our law, under our code. So there's two things going on here. There's the State Environmental Quality Review Act, which any agency has to employ and go through, make a declaration. And then there's the town code and zoning code and site plan, which also will take place. Um, and again, you're absolutely right about the traffic. Um, it's really about uh, in fact, the traffic report cites that the issue it is not so much with traffic on the highway, but it would be the additional time it might take for someone on Panago Place to uh, enter the highway, making a left or right turn. And, um, you know, that will also be uh, something that the planning board can ask for further clarification, further study on, on traffic as part of cycling. That that can that can still happen. So uh, again, I'm I'm very comfortable having spent uh, several years now uh, reviewing this project uh, and all the implications of it, uh, the traffic studies uh, from the previous uh, submissions, the site plan, which I think we got in March uh, uh, back of this of this year. Um, I've I've gone through the plans. Uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable. I think that uh, it's extremely important. And I think the pandemic has really pointed out just how important it would be to have a medical facility here in town. Uh, you know, we still, the hospital's operating testing here in town, but they're doing so in a tent at the high school right now. So, um, you know, I think to be able to have better health care for our community and at the same time, we'll, alleviate a number of the uh, travel times is, is truly important. Can we uh, move forward with the roll call vote at this point? Councilwoman Burke Gonzalez? Aye. Councilman Lee? Aye. Councilwoman Overby? Aye. Councilman Bradman? No. Supervisor Vance Goyak? Aye, Councilman Carey. 
Can, can I just ask, can we uh, notice the public hearing this Thursday so we can have that public hearing sometime in October? Yes. For the zone change? I don't see why not. Great, thank you. Jeff, you have a resolution up next to 2060. That's what we're up to. Um, Sylvia, not me. No, no it's Jeff. Yes. Oh, Jeff. It's me? Okay, hang on. I have to find it here. Page four. Yeah. Uh, resolution 2020-860 is a budget modification in the tax receiver's office. We're simply moving uh, $1,000 from full-time salaries to outside profession. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pass and carried. 2020-861 is to extend seasonal traffic control officer appointments. And... Second. Uh, Aye. That that would be through November first. Sorry. Sorry. We have a second. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passed and carried. We have a resolution eight uh, sixty two, which is to pay out upon resignation of James Stavola, and this is for a gross final payout of eleven thousand four hundred ninety seven dollars <coughs> and cents. Second. We wish, uh, we wish James all the best as he pursues uh, a law degree. Great. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed and carried. 863 is to amend the supervisor's budget for office expense, and that's moving uh, $400 from health insurance to office expense in the same amount. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed and carried. That completes our resolutions for today. Uh, let's let's go on with uh, our topics. We have Jeannie Carosa. Jeannie, we have you on the line still. We have bids. <laughs> yes, I do. I'll be short and sweet. I promise. Um, okay, the first bid to accept is for t-shirts, sweatshirts, and other uniform items. ABC Custom Sales, All-Star Custom Apparel, Express Press, Uniforms Manufacturing, and SP Design Manufacturing, all the um, low apparent bidders for everything. So I have a resolution for that on Thursday. Um, the next is the supply and delivery of outdoor, the outdoor stand, standalone freezer for human services in the amount of $24,225. And that's with Pasco Corp. And um, I'm waiting on a decision about the cell tower climbers. Not sure if I'm going to have that for Thursday. And, and there are other couple. Um, we also did the um, cell tower rebid for um, Montauk. Um, I don't think I'll have them for Thursday. If not, it'll be first thing in October. And other than that, that's it. Questions for Jeannie? Yeah. Thanks very much, Jeannie. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Next up, we have a presentation uh, by Karen Worstein, who's the president and CEO of the Family Service League. Uh, discussing it on the turns program. out, Peter, they had another commitment at, at oh. 1230 so that they had to um, sign off and we'll reschedule them for sometime in October. Okay. I'm sorry they couldn't um, be heard today. We'll try to get them back on as soon as possible. Uh, we have Community Choice Aggregation. We have Lauren Steinberg, Natural Resources Department, and uh, Gordy Interact from um, Harris Gordon. Okay. Gordy, I don't know if Lauren is still on. Um, we'll see. There she is. Hi, Lauren. How are you? Good. How are you? Um, so we're here again to discuss CCA. Um, and I think both Gordian and Lauren are gonna be at the spring CAC meeting tonight as well as they zoom in for that to answer any questions. They had some extra questions from their CAC, from the spring CAC that they'll hope to get to 
um, today so we can understand any of the, the um, issues that are still out there. So Gordian, I'm gonna, or Lauren, whichever one wants to start, go ahead. Um, sure, so I'll just set the stage for what we're gonna talk about today um, and uh, what our presentation is going to focus on. Um, so, <clears throat> um, pull my screen here. So, uh, utility rate making and tariffs can be a complex issue. And as we explore CCA, we have to understand some basic principles on these topics. There has been some discussion as to whether LIPA, through its LI Choice tariff, would be imposing a fee on ESCOs and therefore on CCA customers, and that such a fee would have to be paid even if services were not provided by LIPA. We've also um, been asked whether a CCA on Long Island could uh, offer lower electric rates than LIPA. So I'm going to turn it over to Gordian, who is going to shed some light on these items and uh, present a couple of schematic diagrams to help explain. Yeah, thank you, Lauren, and thank you uh, uh, to the town board to uh, give us another opportunity to talk about community choice aggregation. So um, to, to, uh, to understand these, these somewhat arcane uh, utility tariff and rate making issues a little better. We've come up with a, with a few graphs here that we wanted to show you. So uh, the first very simple uh, thing to understand is that our electric bills from LIPA or PSEG Long Island are broken into two separate components. And uh, that's the delivery charge shown here in, in orange and the power supply charges in blue. Um, what I'm showing here is, is the last actually 14 months of uh, rates uh, on, the, on the delivery and the power supply charges. Um, the delivery charges are pretty predictable and relatively stable. Uh, they're set to a higher rate in the summer season uh, and, and lower in the off season. The power supply, the blue power supply charges are, are less predictable as they vary from month to month because they include the cost of uh, price volatile resources such as fossil fuels, which uh, are used in the power plants to, in conventional power plants to generate the power. And LIPA passes the actual cost through to customers on a monthly basis. And that's why they go up and down. Um, so uh, here, here we're just looking at uh, the power supply charges uh, uh, by itself without showing the delivery charges. Uh, and that's the, I'm showing that separately. So you see that type of volatility uh, directly. And uh, because it's important because that is the portion that is uh, affected and can be influenced uh, by the uh, CCA. So the core picture that we wanted to show you all is, uh, is a comparison uh, between a typical LIPA bill and a typical uh, uh, CCA bill. What happens when, when you are uh, a CCA customer is a little bit different uh, in terms of your bill that what, what happens to a, to a full service LIPA customer. So I, I hope that in this- I'm not this, sure that uh, slide is presenting all the data. I think he's gonna add to it as okay. we go on. Yeah. I didn't so, see that. Um, the first part. So this is your typical full service LIPA customer bill, essentially two portions. Again, the delivery charge, the power supply charge. Uh, we're not showing here the other, uh, other charges and taxes, uh, but that's what, we pay now. And again, as you saw earlier, that of course goes up and down every month. Uh, with a um, consumer, with a, uh, with a CCA, uh, or an, as an ESCO, ESCO customer, an energy service company customer, uh, things look a little different. The, um, the, uh, the CCA or ESCO customer would uh, pay the PSCG or LIPA uh, delivery charge, exactly the same delivery charge, uh, but the power supply charges uh, are split into four different 
components. Uh, and uh, they include things like on-island capacity, uh, off-island capacity, energy, and uh, ancillary services. Now, ancillary services are voltage and frequency control and other esoteric but important services <laughs> that are necessary to maintain the stability of the electric grid. So for the, for the LIPA uh, customer, for the full service customer, the power supply components are not broken out. And, uh, but of course, these components you see here, uh, LIPA must, of course, purchase and provide these services in order to offer electric service. But they're all lumped into, for the customer bill, into one charge, which is called the power supply component. For the ESCO, or the CCA, uh, the, the CCA purchases power from the ESCO, um, things get a little more involved. So when the, when the CCA chooses to buy power from an energy service company, the, the ESCO must provide the services and the customers, the CCA customers pay for the, pay, pay the ESCOs for these services. If an ESCO cannot provide a certain service like on island capacity, for example, uh, then LIPA must provide this service. And of course, for that, CCA customers must pay. Um, and so that's where maybe some of the confusion is coming from. Uh, can I ask a question? What, can you define on-island capacity and off-island capacity? Sure, good question. So on-island capacity is required by New York State uh, rules. The New York State Independent System Operator puts certain requirements on that. And most of our power plant capacity, uh, because we are what is called a load pocket. We are at the end of the line and don't have lines coming in from all over the place, like maybe a, a region upstate. Uh, we are considered a load pocket and therefore we have to have a very high amount of power generation located right here on the island. Uh, and so the reason why an ESCO may have a difficult time providing that on-island capacity is that most of this capacity are older legacy plants and some newer plants, the Caithness plant, et cetera, uh, and some renewable energy installations, but they are under contract with LIPA and they're under long-term contracts with LIPA. Some of these contracts expire and there might be an opportunity when they expire over the next few years to free that, that on-island capacity up for uh, alternative suppliers like ESCOs, <clears throat> excuse me. But for the time being, it um, will be a challenge, we think, uh, for an, an energy service company to provide power capacity that's located on the island. And off-island capacity is capacity that's uh, in other parts of the state or the region. So when the South Fork Wind Farm comes online, that's considered off-island capacity? No, that would be because it's connected in East Hampton, that would be on-island capacity. Okay. Thanks, Gordon. So um, the, 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 there's a tariff that LIPA has and has had for, for quite a while, the, the Long Island Choice tariff. And that tariff provides a mechanism to ensure that these various charges and credits are applied so that a CCA customers, uh, CCA customers pay each provider for the services that the, that the respective providers uh, uh, offer. And so, so if the service comes from LIPA, they have to pay LIPA for that. If the service comes from an ESCO, they pay the ESCO for it. There's no fee charged for uh, charged by LIPA, uh, and there's no fee for services that LIPA does not provide. There was some discussion about that in the papers, uh, and that that's a that's a myth that doesn't doesn't actually ha happen. Uh, LIPA passes any cost for services that they provide through to customers at market rates, and uh, they do that without an adder or any additional fee. So CCA 
customers can save money, uh, but only when their CC when the CCA is able to negotiate uh, below market rates for the power supply services that the ESCO provides to them. Uh, the remainder of the LIPA bill, so that's the delivery, and if they can't, if the ESCO cannot provide the on-island capacity, that that portion you see here, uh, that remainder will then have to be paid to, to LIPA. Uh, and um, those portions will fluctuate as they always have, whether you are the CCA customer or not. So that's the basics. Um, oops, that's the basic of this somewhat complex mechanism that's spelled out in the in the Long Island Choice Tariff that governs how a CCA, when it purchases power supply from an energy service company, uh, would be would be billed would be billed would receive credits and charges from LIPA and charges from the ESCO. Uh, this, as I said earlier, is not to scale. So the, the diagram uh, just right now shows uh, both customers getting exactly, getting charged for exactly the same amount. Uh, but of course, the LIPA, we know the LIPA uh, uh, bills and charges fluctuate every month. Uh, that can be different with, an, with, a, with a CCA customer. Uh, and an ESCO. So now we got to go back to um, to the uh, to the to the light bulb power supply charges for a moment uh, when we want to answer the question whether uh, CCA could provide uh, a lower cost electric supply. So since the light bulb supply uh, uh, goes up and down, and the CCA typically enters into a long term power supply agreement and offers uh, offers a, uh, a fixed rate, uh, we have to compare not to a monthly uh, power supply charge, but to the average over time. Right? So when you typically, typically a CCA enters into longer term contracts, say two year, three year contracts, and uh, to compare this, the uh, to compare the fixed CCA power supply cost to the LIPA variable cost, we've got to look at the annual annual average shown here in the uh, dotted blue line. And um, if the CCA's power, su power supply costs uh, for that long-term contract uh, comes in below the blue line, then CCA customers have saved money. However, if the if it comes in above the blue line, then CCA customers, uh, you see that in the, in the dotted red line here, then they ended up paying more. So uh, while we can look at past performance for, um, you know, for light bus power supply charges over the last few years, and we may be able to make an educated guess as to where that might end up over the next couple of years, we cannot, of course, predict the future as a CCA, nobody can. Now, a CCA can offer a greener, better product. It can offer a more predictable and, and stable uh, prices. And possibly it can yield some cost savings, but it cannot guarantee those cost savings. And uh, to sum it up, I mean, community choice aggregation can be a very powerful tool for customers, uh, for our communities and for municipalities, uh, because we can choose where our energy comes from. The CCA could offer its customers, for example, a choice of power products, uh, let's say three power, uh, power products, like a 100% uh, renewable energy project sourced uh, locally from a local facility, and then a 100% renewable energy product uh, made up of renewable energy credits from across New York State. And uh, the third product could be a product with a blend of renewable energy and fossil energy. And so customers would be free to choose, CCA customers would be free to choose the product that they think meets their preferences and, uh, and their budget. 
CCAs and their suppliers are regulated by New York State Public Service Commission and uh, the purchase of renewable energy credits is regulated and tracked by the uh, New York State uh, Generation Asset Tracking System. So um, that's a good thing because that means we can be sure that when we buy and pay for renewable energy products or renewable energy credits, we in fact support the transition to 100% renewable energy in the state and here in East Hampton. And lastly, to sum up, in, in, in for East Hampton, CCA could turn out to be one additional tool to help us accelerate the transition to community-wide 100% renewable energy supply. And uh, with that, it's back to it's back to you, Lauren, or if there are any questions, we can take them now as well. Odin, can you just, I want to make sure I understand this. Um, I got what you were, I understood what you were saying about on-island capacity, that if an ESCO, you know, can't, can't book that, then we wind up paying LIPA because they have on-island capacity. Was that a correct statement? LIPA has on-island capacity. I missed that, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, LIPA has the on-island capacity. Okay. Under Does off-island capacity work the same way? In other words, it, it sounds sort of like LIPA has sort of reserved room in the pipe or the wire, and that if an ESCO can, can buy power that has, that can put power into that off uh, island uh, section of the of the wires, then they're not going to pay an extra charge to LIPA. But if they can't, they will. Is that correct? That's right. They, if they can provide the capacity, the on island capacity, then we as ESCO customers, as a CCA, would pay the ESCO for that capacity. Does the same thing work with off island capacity? Is what I was asking. That's right. Off island capacity would be provided. Off island capacity would be provided by the ESCO typically, and we pay the ESCO for that off island capacity and the energy. Oh, and is paying for the off island capacity is that payment to PSEG LIPA? No, that that that's if it's provided by the ESCO, it it is paid to the ESCO. Okay, I get it. Okay. Can I, can I ask, is there a certain percentage that has to come from on-island capacity? Like, what would stop the ESCO from getting everything off-island? Great question. Uh, yes, so there is a requirement, as I said, by the New York, New York uh, Independent System Operator that um, requires that, uh, I don't know the exact percentage, but the vast majority of capacity needed on Long Island must be located on Long Island. Uh, who made that rule? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a it's reliability rule. In terms <laughs> of reliability. I think that makes a strong argument for in fact having renewables uh, such as South Wharf Wind Farm, mm -hmm. because that then becomes part of LIPA's on island capacity. Is that correct, Gordian? That's correct. So we get more of Long Island's capacity being provided by renewables, that's a benefit. Yes. Yeah. Think, would, think, would, yeah. Any, would, any, how, would any would any wind power that's supplying anywhere in Long Island, I assume that would be that would count as on island capacity, right? So right. If it's, if it's interconnected to the Long Island grid, it counts as on island capacity. So there are going to be other there are going to be other wind projects that are coming in further up island that would create on island capacity for us. Right, that's possible. But the cables that are coming in, say by Jones Beach, from where are they coming from? New Jersey. Those would be considered off island capacity. I believe so. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I believe so because they're coming through another transmission grid. Right? They're coming, uh, you know, it's just like like upstate capacity 
doesn't count because it comes to a vast network of an electric grid uh, that's that's not on. Not, it's not directly. It's not like a power plant directly connected to the Long Island grid. Mm -hmm. right? So a wind farm is different because it's it's one power generating asset that plugs directly into the Long Island grid. Doesn't go through the New York grid or the New Jersey grid or the Pennsylvania grid, etc. So is is Jones Beach Jones Beach is not part of the Long Island grid? The cable the, is that the Jupiter cable? Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's a connection to the uh, New Jersey, Maryland, and Pennsylvania grid. Right. Right. So that I I assume, and again, I have not mm. checked this, but I would assume that is treated the same way as um, a connection to the New York grid. So it would not be counted. Would be my guess. It would not be counted as on island capacity. Considered off island. It would be co considered off island capacity. And Gordian, for a CCA, we have to be looking at New York produced electricity. We're not looking to hydropower out of Canada or any other source. We have to use New York. Yeah, it's got, yes, basically, yes. Most of, most of it would have to be, um, and now has to be uh, sourced in New York State. It used to be that you could buy relatively cheap uh Renewable power from, uh, let's say, Texas wind farms, uh, that, that's not possible anymore. Um, in order to be, uh, uh, you know, tracked in that tracking system, the New York tracking system, the generation has to be in New York State. And it has to qualify and, you know, meet certain minimum criteria, et cetera. So it's a pretty strict system that's in place now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This was very helpful. Thank you. Welcome. Sure. So um, if there aren't any more questions from the board about the presentation, um, you know, we got have been getting some other questions that we, uh, you know, that were very good questions and we thought was important to address at today's work session. So um, if the board doesn't mind, we could run through those really quickly. Yeah, please go ahead, Warren. Okay. That's so. Fine. Um, the first question is, um, can you opt in or opt out at any time? And is there any penalty for changing back and forth? Um, so the answer is yes. Most customers may opt in or opt out at any time without penalty or interruption in their service. Um, however, customers that opt out or opt in, depending on when in the billing cycle they do that, they may not see that action take effect on their utility bill for one to two billing cycles. Um, is that the same yeah. for commercial and residential? I believe so, yes. Thank you. Um, and there are certain con certain circumstances that might affect when a customer can uh, opt out or opt in. Um, for instance, customers that are already receiving service from Inesco or customers that have um, a freeze or a hold placed on their account at the time a CCA program is made available, those customers would need to opt in. Um, so. Um, a customer that has, for example, a contract with an ESCO um, would have to check the conditions of that contract to see when they could opt in to CCA. So they just have to be cognizant of that. Um, and a CCA can also require that special considerations be made for low income customers or um, assistant program participants uh, and how they can opt in or opt out. But most customers will be able to opt in or opt out anytime. Um, the next question is, are people who uh, opt in getting the same energy as people who opt out and will rates go down um, as more people opt in? So the first question goes back to the point that, you know, the electrons that are running through the grid and power homes can't be tracked back to their sources, um, whether that's renewable or fossil fuel. Uh, generated. So a CCA customer that is purchasing a renewable power product is getting the same energy through the grid as a non-CCA customer. Uh, however, the CCA customer who is purchasing renewable energy is doing more to support the growth and development of renewable energy markets by creating an increased demand for uh, power supply that's generated through renewables. And uh, you know, not to be forgotten, the town of East Hampton did set a community-wide 100% renewable energy 
goals. Um, and that needs the participation of the community to reach those goals and bring more renewable energy to East Hampton. And uh, the second part of that question is, will rates go down as more people opt in? Um, well, the, the more customers that are participating, the greater the negotiating power a CCA has. And that's the idea behind the aggregation component of community choice aggregation. So, you know, ideally we'd want as many participants as possible to be enrolled in CCA. Um, next question is given the energy resources available to us now, what percentage of green energy can we expect if 100% of customers opt in? And I think that um, this can also be worded as, um, you know, what can we expect if 100% of customers remain enrolled and don't opt out? Um, and so basically, if 100% of East Hampton electric customers were to select uh, to purchase a 100% renewable energy product, then 100% of our aggregated electricity consumption will be generated from renewable energy sources and pumped into the grid, um, offsetting the generation of that volume of power from fossil fuels. And next, um, what percentage of our bills will be transmission costs as opposed to the actual cost of energy? So um, as we saw in one of Gordian's earlier slides, um, the percentage of our bills that is transmission costs and the percentage that is energy cost fluctuates, but it's roughly about 50-50. And depending on the cost for energy that a CCA buys from UNESCO, those percentages can be different. Um, if a CCA, for instance, purchases power at a lower price, then the percentage of customers' bills um, that is energy will be less. The next question, uh, will there be a differential between peak and non-peak usage as there is in other communities? And uh, we think this question's pertaining to um, time of use rate customers. Um, so there are uh, customers in a uh, time of use rate class where they pay a higher um, cost for power during peak times and a lower cost for power during off-peak times. So if the CCA chooses to include customer classes with existing time of use rates, then yes, they would need to offer um, those time of use rates to those customers. And then the last question is, uh, East Hampton has explored joining the South, joining with Southampton and possibly Brookhaven in forming a CCA. What's the status of those explorations? And is there an optimum number of participants to make a CCA most effective? Um, so, uh, you know, we, the town board and, and we talked um, a couple of times about how joining with Southampton with Brookhaven is uh, definitely a potential option for East Hampton. Um, we have not yet had conversations with Southampton or Brookhaven regarding forming a joint CCA. Uh, Southampton and Brookhaven are further along in um, the process of, of looking into CCA. They've already passed their enabling legislation. And I believe that Southampton has already submitted their um, implementation and data protection plans to the Public Service Commission for review. Um, so passing enabling legislation really sends a message that these, you know, that to these municipalities that East Hampton is serious about looking into whether a CCA could work here. And it gives us a seat at the table to have those conversations. Um, you know, the enabling legislation also allows the town to work with other municipalities to develop a CCA program. Um, so that would be the next step. And uh, regarding the number of uh, CCA customers, um, you know, as we mentioned before, the more the better. Um, the more customers that are aggregated, the more negotiating power a CCA has, uh, and the more likelihood that the CCA would be successful. Thank you, Mark. Any, yeah. uh, any other questions? Comments? No, I think this has been really helpful, and I want to thank um, Gordian for the time that he's given to us to help us understand this, and to Lauren, um, who works um, with the Natural Resources Department for really honing in and, and becoming an expert for um, the town in this and, and appreciate all your time. I know you're again gonna do this uh, tonight. And uh, again, thank you for your time and the effort that you've put into it and the knowledge that you've been able to give to the community for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren and Gordy and appreciate that. And at this point, um, I'd like to, between uh, work session agenda items, see if we have any callers on the line. 
I think we had had some people calling in during that presentation. There are two callers on the line. I can unmute the first one in queue right now. Sure. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Hello, caller. You're live on the air with the town board. Hello, caller. Are you there? Hearing nothing, I um, do have one other caller. I can see if they're available. Hello, caller. You're live with the town board. Hello, caller. Hello. I think some people are using the phone number to actually listen to the meeting rather than to make public comment. I think that explains why a number of callers um, have dialed in but don't respond uh, okay. once they're brought on. But we'll, uh, if you get any more callers, we'll try to take comment if, uh, if there is a caller active on the line. Thank you. So uh, our next agenda item is this Community Preservation Fund Water Quality requests for applications. And these are the grant recommendations. Uh, we have with us the chair of the Water Quality Technical Advisory Committee, Christopher Clapp and Melissa Winslow from our own natural resources uh, and CPF uh, land management departments. Uh, so welcome both of you. Um, you have a presentation of the recommended water quality projects, which the town board has reviewed as well, and we're making those now uh, public for discussion. So I'm Melissa Winslow, I'm a senior environmental analyst with the town natural resources department. Um, and I'm here today with Chris Clapp, who's the chair of the CPF water quality committee. Um, I'm going to provide an overview of the process and then uh, Chris as the chair is going to provide the recommendations for awards to the board. Great. Um, so just to provide a, a quick overview, um, so the request for applications was developed uh, so the Water Quality Technical Advisory Committee and the Town Board uh, could receive applications for water quality improvement projects through a standardized process uh, with set requirements that allows for enough detail um, to be acquired to review and prioritize projects for funding. Um, this allows for efficient review, direct comparisons between projects and maintains consistency. Um, and also allows for the best use of CPF water quality funding. Um, so this round is the second one for the year. Um, the RFA was issued on June 22nd, and the due date was August 20th. Uh, in the notice, the amount of funding available is uh, $500,000, um, but there's also potential for additional funding based on status of existing approved pod projects and uh, what's remaining in the fund at the end of the year. Um, so we received a total of 10 projects this round. Uh, all of the projects were reviewed by an internal town committee on September 1st and held a special meeting with the Water Quality Technical Advisory Committee to review and approve complete applications on September 2nd. Uh, we had four complete projects that will be recommended by the Water Quality Committee for funding. One project that was approved by the committee um, for funding if uh, an additional award is available in 2020 pending other projects and then five projects were not recommended for 2020 funding awards. Um, so this just gives a little bit more detail on all of the projects that were received this round. Um, we had four not-for-profit innovative alternative or low nitrogen septic system upgrades that came in for funding. Um, these were Springs Improvement Society for Ashwa Hall, uh, Center for Clean Water Technology for St. Luke's Church Rectory, as well as a property owned by Peconic Land Trust on Springs Fireplace Road um, and Nappy Camping Club. There were also three commercial IA septic system upgrades uh, at Crow's Nest in Montauk, uh, Main Street Tavern in Amagansett, and Morty's Oyster Bar in Nappy. Um, there was one sewage treatment plant um, proposal for Montauk Shores, one environmental dredging uh, project for Town Pond, that was put forward by the village of East Hampton, and then one stormwater abatement project that was put forward by the village of Sag Harbor. Uh, the Water Quality Committee will be recommending a total of $522,895 today, uh, with an additional uh, award of $230,000 or $30,001. 
Um, so the five projects that are being recommended will be dis discussed in additional detail and slides to follow by Chris. Um, and then the five projects that did not receive a recommendation from the committee uh, was based on either ineligibility, uh, lack of available funding, and or uh, the project didn't receive a high enough score based on water quality criteria or sustainability to receive a recommendation this round. So this just shows what the committee is to score each project. Um, the, there's several mandatory criteria um, based on the water quality law to make sure that each project meets uh, the requirements dictated by the town and the uh, New York State Water Quality Improvement Law. Um, these include um, requirement to pro provide a measurable water quality improvement. Uh, the duration of the project must exceed five years. Uh, the project can't be required under law by a mandate. The project must use demonstrated technology that's proven to work. Um, property ownership is required to ensure that the project will actually follow through. Uh, project feasibility demonstrated um, must be a project type that's included in the water quality improvement plan and the CPF law. And then the property also can't have any open violations with the town. Um, so once projects meet the mandatory criteria, um, there's also scoring criteria. So the committee can prioritize and rank projects out of 100. Um, so we look at uh, water quality improvement, the significance of the improvement, uh, the distance to a priority water body. Um, there's also cost factors that basically look at what's the bang for the buck for the project and did they provide uh, enough of detail for the committee to uh, review the project, project readiness and goals, um, and then also maintenance, monitoring, and evaluation, basically the, the future sustainability and um, longevity of the project. So all projects were ranked, and projects that scored an 85 or higher uh, were recommended for funding this round. And this is just an overview of how the committee determines um, funding awards for septic upgrades. Um, so projects are prioritized based on uh, location. So if they're in the water protection district or priority area, a uh, higher flow or failing system, or if it's known to have a contribution to a priority water body. Um, municipal properties uh, owned by the town, villages, county, or state, such as parks, uh, recreational facilities, police stations, EMS, or comfort stations can receive up to 100% of the uh, ask for design and installation. Uh, publicly accessible spaces are not for profits. Um, rel religious centers, libraries, schools, fire districts can receive 100% of the design and installation costs with adequate justification. Um, for high, res uh, high density residences, uh, affordable and senior housing is uh, basically the same, uh, up to 100% de for design and installation. Uh, condominiums, townhouses, HOAs, and trailer parks. Um, the design is not an approved cost, but they can get uh, an award for the installation costs uh, normalized to what a single family home would receive from a rebate from the town. Uh, traditional commercial properties or for-profit enterprises um, would receive, if they're in a priority area or within the water protection district, up to 65% of justified installation costs only, so no design engineering or consultant fees included, um, or up to 50% if they're not located in a priority area. And this would be capped at $200,000. And then lastly, um, water, warehousing and industrial properties would be um, eligible for only the septic incentive program through the town, not through the RFA. So with that said, uh, Chris Clapp, who's the chair of the committee, will just do an overview of each project and provide the recommendation for funding to the town board. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for, uh, for sticking with us here. Um, happy to present these five projects to you. So this one has, has been an applicant in the past and um, and, and was part of the reason why we, uh, uh, you know, for fairness sake, we revised some of the criteria by which we evaluate 
uh, over the last couple of years have been looking at how we could make this program more attractive to uh, a wider uh, uh, use of people. And uh, this, is, this is a great one, a uh, great project to demonstrate how to, uh, to get more uh, community-based projects into the mix here. So uh, they're proposing an, a, an advanced onsite treatment system at Asheville Hall uh, to reduce their, their nutrient and bacterial loads. Uh, as you know, it's right there in the back of Akabonic Harbor, uh, where a whole bunch of other work has been uh, ongoing as of recently as well. Uh, they're looking to treat 800 gallons per day of wastewater uh, at, the, at their peak use. And um, we recommend, the advisory committee recommends to the town board awarding Asheville Hall $82,395 to the Springs Improvement Society uh, as they are a non-for-profit uh, organization and non-for-profit owned property. Here's a, a photo of the property, as most of you have probably been there before, and a uh, outline of the treatment train. Uh, you see the treatment units, uh, the septic tank and treatment units on the west side of the northwest side of the property going to the leaching galleys uh, further in towards the triangle. Okay. Uh, the Center for T Clean Water Technology put in two applications this year. Uh, the one which was going to move forward is the is for the installation of a nitrogen reducing biofilter. This is a non proprietary technology uh, being explored by the Center for Clean Water Technology and has produced uh, really good results thus far in the over the last almost ten years now, and uh, they think they could get at least 80% of nitrogen uh, out of the systems. And uh, this is for uh, the rectory at St. Luke's Church. Uh, anticipated flow is just about a typical four bedroom home. Uh, and we um, recommend to the town board awarding them $49,000 uh, to the Center for Clean Water Technology to move this project forward. Uh, here's a, just a cartoon of what, the, what that type of system looks like. It really relies uh, on a septic tank and a pump to disperse the effluent over a layer of sand, which converts the ammonium created in the septic tank into nitrate. And then that nitrate then goes through a lined layer of uh, sand and sawdust or sand and wood chip mixture which creates the environment that converts the nitrate to nitrogen gas, uh, you know, thereby leaving only a small amount of organic nitrogen uh, leaving the system. And next, Melissa. Okay, and you can, uh, as you all know, St. Luke's Church is just towards the north end of Town Pond. Um, again, another area where we've been focusing a bit of efforts uh, between Hook Pond and Town Pond together, the complex, freshwater complex there together, uh, have a number of projects in this area. So they're in, in direct uh, contact with those waters. Um, here, here's another great example of uh, how the, the, the changes to the program brought in some new participants. Uh, we especially did some outreach last fall to the uh, South Lake, uh, Fort Pond, and Akabonic Harbor area um, commercial properties, and uh, happy to see another one come in. This is a, a, for the Crow's Nest uh, which is right on the water on South Lake on Old West Lake Drive. Uh, their density flow allows them a thousand and two gallons per day. Uh, so that's total, their total allowable uh, and proposed flow. Um, I'm sorry, their, their allowable pre existing and proposed flow is 6,078 gallons per day as it's a uh, grandfathered property. Uh, their total project cost was uh, $495,017. Their request was 488567 of that. 
under the guidance document that the committee had drafted last fall. Uh, they, are, they reached their funding cap of $200,000 as a commercial property. Uh, so the uh, committee recommends to the town board an award of $200,000 to the crow's nest. And okay, here's the, the aerial and the site plan of the property. The, all of the um, leaching and treatment will be on the southwest corner of the property, the, as far away from the water as they could get it. Um, and it will consist of uh, two treatment units and I think 39, I think was the number of uh, leaching galleys uh, in the vicinity of what is currently their uh, volleyball courts. Okay, back to uh, Town Pond. Uh, here's an uh, application uh, from the village of East Hampton to do some environmental dredging of uh, silts and nutrients that have accumulated in the pond uh, over the years. Uh, they're, they're looking for a total removal of those nutrients um, from the pond to help improve uh, the health of the pond in general, as well as to help improve stormwater retention and, and residence time as uh, Town Pond is a uh, contributor to Hook Pond. So this will ultimately have a uh, benefit on, on Hook Pond as well. Um, it's, it's recommended within the town's water quality improvement plan already and is a shovel ready project already permitted by New York State DEC. USGS will, will, will um, do the monitoring for the project, which is also a, a great um, partnership here. Uh, had a really high score uh, from, the, from the, the town's work group and our rec recommended award is $191,500 of a total project cost of $868,000. So uh, some good leverage from the town on this project. And again, part of a, a better concentration of efforts on Hook and Town Pond there. Okay, and here's some, here's some drawings of the site and where silt fencing will be and stockpiling of the, 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 the dredge material before it gets carted away. Finally, uh, the village of Sag Harbor has an uh, addition to uh, a lot of the ongoing work in Sag Harbor on their stormwater projects. Uh, there, um, a little bit of a change uh, in addition to some of the projects we've seen there or recently, but this continues the stormwater work along Bay Street uh, with some uh, rain gardens and pervious pavers to reduce the stormwater flow uh, that goes directly down uh, through the boat ramp and or through the uh, catch basins, which also have an outfall next to the boat ramp. So this adds, uh, gets water in the ground uh, before it has a chance to get into those catch basins and, and conveyance systems. Uh, the village will be maintain and monitor the project. Um, and we're looking at uh, a reasonable amount of phosphorus nitrogen and pathogen reduction uh, going into the harbor. Uh, they're looking roughly at uh, almost a 50% match on this project. So the total project cost is $486,002 and they're looking for $236,002 uh, uh, of which the committee deemed uh, $230,001 uh, as eligible. Um, yes, we sharpen our pencils often. Um, as eligible for funding. Um, and so we recommend to the town board that if the budget allows at the, at the time that we reviewed this project, just about, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we weren't sure how much, how much more funding was going to be left in the budget for this year, um, to, in, in order to leave enough money for septic rebates to continue through December. Um, so, you know, we, it was a little bit close to get this fully funded. Um, so if, if it allows, if the budget allows, we'd like to move this money forward. 
Um, uh, if not, then it will be reconsidered uh, in the first round of next year's cycle. And I think we have some diagrams for the project here. So I believe the, the area that, that, that we're looking to capture um, is, the, is the area in green. So it's the, the, that, that strip of Bay Street um, leading up to um, the, the uh, uh, Sag Harbor Marine. We're looking for some, some pervious pavement in the, the parking spaces near the, um, I believe that's, that's the project area there. Yeah, in front of Seg Harbor Marine, Permeous Pavement and Rain Gardens. Okay, uh, Melissa, do you want to uh, take this from here? As sure. the, talk um, so in total, uh, the Water Quality Committee is recommending to the town board to award um, a little over 500000 so 522895 dollars to Ashwa Hall, um, St. Luke's Rectory, or Center for Clean Water Technology for their NRB project there. Um, Crow's Nest is a commercial IA upgrade in the village of East Hampton, Town Pond Ridge. Um, and then if the budget allows uh, this additional award of $230,001 um, to the village of Sag Harbor for the Bay Street stormwater abatement, um, that would be a total of $752,896 for the second round of the RFA yep. this year. And that's all we have. Any, any questions for Chris or Melissa? So just procedural, will we be noticing this for this for public hearing uh, this week? Yes. Yep. Great. Yes. So it should be a public hearing in October. And also, my question would be, it's, I know we've funded, I think, 1.25 in phase one, and then also for last year. Is there a time frame that we're going to uh, give applicants that we have, uh, uh, are granting funding to, uh, a time frame that we have given to them to start their project before funding might be uh, brought back? Um, basically, we, we want to wait until the contract is finalized and the, uh, the funds are um, dedicated before um, the project is started um, and you know once that that process is complete um, it's you know they're ready to go and get started on the project with you know engineering if necessary or installation if that's what the project requires I, I think the question is uh, how much time before they start before we call back the funds is that the question that's that's correct because I think okay. my overall effect uh, uh, our, our availability for funding other applicants that are coming that might be more shovel ready. Right, exactly. So I think that that's a great point. I think, I believe uh, John could tell me otherwise, answer otherwise, but I believe there's an 18 month start window. The way we have it written in the contracts thus far, yeah. um, you know, they have a year to complete the project and then there's um, the potential for an additional um, two one-year extensions if the project isn't completed for whatever reason. Um, so, for example, for the, the awards that were provided last year, um, you know, because of the COVID pandemic, um, some of those projects weren't able to get started this year. So those, those will be coming in for an extension. So that looks like if that's about three years, and this is the second year of it now, well, in about in the, in a, a year, a year and a half from now, we might figure out we might be able to recapture some of that funding that we had dedicated potentially before it rolls over. Yeah, I, I believe that the, it doesn't come back to the water quality line. I believe it goes back to the general CPF fund and we cannot recapture those funds. So we, we, we really look for shovel ready projects. Okay. Uh, we'd like to see people with, uh, that's, that's part, part of the reason why we, uh, for many of these more complicated uh, IA installations for commercial properties and other bigger projects, why it's better if they come, well, there's two reasons why they come with design in hand. One, it's better justification for budgeting. And the two, it, sh it shows that they're ready to go um, because permitting for one of those things could take a year in and of itself. So 
the closer they are to getting those permits sent in, uh, you know, the, the more likely it is going to get over the finish line within that, that timeline. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Any other questions for Chris or Melissa? No, I'm good. Thank you. Chris, Melissa, I want to thank you both for all the hard work you've put in uh, on the committee and all the committee members who've do donated and dedicated their time to volunteer. We have a really great committee. Uh, so again, thanks for all your work on the behalf of town board to review and vet these applications and to help us improve our water quality throughout the town. So we're excited to move forward. We'll have a public hearing scheduled in the, probably in October uh, for these projects. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you, town board for your time. Thank Thanks. you all. Have a great afternoon. Chris. Michael, uh, I see we, ha we had uh, another caller call in. Yes, I will unmute that caller right now. Great. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Who's calling? Yes, hi. Uh, this is Nan French. How are you doing, Peter? Hi, Nan. I'm well. How are you? Good. Good. Can I make a comment now about the deep water wind, or do I have to wait Absolutely. till you discuss it? Uh, please, please go ahead. We have you on the line. We'd like to hear from you now. But okay. Um, um, I, I, I believe that it would have been better to wait until the town till the border wind went through all the different processes and got all their improve, approve, approvals before we negotiated with them. I just think it would have put us in a much better position. Um, so that's my personal feeling, and I wish the town board would have waited, but I know the town board has been working very hard for many years to try to do the best thing for our town. Um, and secondly, um, I have a deep, seated opinion about the deep water wind farm that I just want to express to you. Um, I feel that the wind in the summer dies down. And that's a fact, it's not just me saying it. And we're supposed to have the deep water wind project help us in the summer, but at that time it will be dying down. So it's not really going to help us at that time where we need it at our peak hours. And therefore, we'll, we'll have to have fossil fuel plants, quick start fossil fuel plants further up island to help us. So in a way, it's not as green as we'd like it to be. So that's my feeling. I just fe felt that I needed to express it being a citizen of East Hampton for a long time. I just think that this is not the best project, even though we all want green energy and we want to do the best we can for the town. I think that this one has flaws in it and other ones too, but I don't really want to talk about the maintenance and different things and the fishermen, but um, I think there's a lot of flaws in this one. So thank you for listening to me. Thanks for taking the time to call us and let us know your opinion. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Be well. Michael, do we have any other callers on the line? No, we do not at this time. Okay, let's move on next to um, our outdoor dining pilot program. We have Nancy Lynn Thiel with us today. Um, as the board members know, um, the history of outdoor dining uh, in East Hampton has included uh, a pilot project um, couple years ago now uh, in, in Montauk, uh, which no one chose to take advantage of. Uh, and the town board also reviewed the code regarding outdoor dining to relax the outdoor dining requirements. I believe it was last year we voted on allowing up to 30% of the indoor capacity to be placed outdoors uh, for outdoor dining. Um, some folks did take advantage of that and as everyone knows, uh, here at, during the time of COVID, through an emergency declaration and emergency orders, which I renew every five days, we've allowed uh, for restaurants to have up to 100% of their current indoor capacity placed outdoors through an application process with the town under full review of the fire marshal to ensure that social distancing 
and proper fire safety and egress are met. Um, also, uh, anyone participating in outdoor dining must wear a mask uh, if they're not seated. Uh, and there are certain protocols as to how the, the seating again is laid out. Um, so, you know, that's sort of the backdrop of the, of the current discussion. Um, I asked Nancy Lynn to uh, work on a draft um, and to be able to present to the town board so that we could have a discussion about uh, perhaps entering into a pilot project, pilot program uh, to transfer uh, indoor dining use to the outdoors and what would be uh, a more relaxed occupancy. And obviously we would want to have um, some guidelines on that and make sure. Uh, I think one of the points of discussion will be about parking. Um, I, personally, I'd, I'd be a little concerned if the outdoor dining took up parking spaces, which we're now allowing under the emergency order uh, to make that permanent, I think, would be counter to good planning. Um, so I suspect the other board members feel would feel similarly about a reduction of parking, um, but we'll certainly have a discussion about that. Nancy Lynn, do you want to yeah. give us a, a walkthrough? I know the board members uh, received the, uh, the current draft that we're going to be discussing, um, but if you can kind of walk us through uh, where it's in the code, why it would be proposed there, and what process sure. take place. We're looking to do a pilot program um, to do this as a special permit. Um, we have a special permit section within our zoning, and we're looking to set it up there. If it's successful and it seems to work well, we can uh, easily uh, transition it into our special permit section, um, and uh, it will have... Uh, uh, the uh, some of the safeguards and some of the review and and uh, violation um, provisions that are already in in the code, so it will be consistent with those. We're looking to, uh, as as you said before, um, you know, right now for using um, outdoor space for dining, um, we you can get permission to do so either. Some there are a few out there that still have it from a, a pre-existing before code. Uh, some have it from site plan. Um, we're looking to do it as a special permit here. You can also get it through for you know one-time basis on a special event permit, or uh, we also have the outdoor dining at restaurants. And Peter, it does seem like it was just last year, but it was actually in 2017 that we uh, added that. Okay, so thanks for that. It, it has been it has been effective, and and some of those provisions we're, we're working with this, and we may actually. It may be and may work out best to kind of merge them so that um, we're all under, you know, one uh, one. If this pilot program works out, it may be best to merge that in and, and do it so uh, people can look in just a couple places to see what they're doing. We're talking about um, uh, limiting this only to restaurant dining use. We're not looking to do outdoor bars. Uh, we're looking to do outdoor dining use. So then we're we're talking about limited to the service of food and beverages to seated patrons. Um, and we're looking to transfer that to outdoor space, um, being able to uh, uh, approve uh, indoor use, being able to be transferred to outdoor spaces. Um, we're not talking about any outdoor food preparations either, or walk up, um, serve, uh, walk up point of sale bars. Um, we're talking about being able to do this not only seasonally, which is kind of what we already have under our outdoor dining at restaurants provisions, but also weather related, which um, I think would add some additional flexibility for some of these restaurants um, that if it's a great day outside, then maybe more of their occupancy are outside than inside and vice versa if you get a rain day or, or as it gets cooler. Um, it would be uh, required that a, approvable seating plans are submitted for each possible circumstance so that if uh, code enforcement or the fire marshals were come on the site, they'd know um, under which seating plan the um, uh, the uh, establishment was working under. Um, we are not looking for any um, additional occupancy. This is just the approved occupancy being able to be um, a little bit more flexible. If you want additional occupancy, obviously go through what we already have for site plan review. 
Um, and we're talking about, um, when we're talking about the um, approved indoor seating, it's either uh, the seating capacity is determined by the site plan or if no site plan um, number has been reached, then it's the um, occupancy for indoor dining, not the bar use, but the indoor dining as determined by the fire marshal. So if you have a dining room area that has been, uh, has an occupancy rating for 35, that's your 35 that can move around. If you also have a second area that's bar area, that would have to remain indoor. Um, the outdoor space must be on the same property that has the approved restaurant or indoor dining use. So we're not talking about using adjacent uh, uh, properties or um, other sites. Uh, if, uh, if the outdoor space is located more, um, has to be um, located more than 100 feet of a structure that's used for residential purposes, and it has to be configured such that noise and other effects generated would be reasonably screened from adjacent properties and compatible with existing and potential uses thereon. Where such an adjacent property is a residential property or any property with an occupied residence, complete screening of the activity and its effects shall be deemed necessary to meet this requirement so that we are not imposing on, on people's um, use of their own homes in, in a manner uh, by allowing some outdoor use. Um, if the outdoor space is to be used for the service of alcoholic beverages, it must be delineated from all other outdoor space such that the consumption of such beverages is limited to within that space and that the occupancy and limitation can be um, uh, uh, determined in the same manner as indoor dining. That's at a ratio of 15 square feet per person um, and the occupancy limit shall be clearly posted. Um, That's it. That's an SLA requirement as well, that any area that where alcohol beverages are served is delineated from the rest of the property, correct? That's correct. So that you don't have, uh, um, it's, it's to limit um, the, the possible um, consumption by those who, who are underage. So you make sure that it's, it's in a controlled area. Um, uh, the, um, we're talking about, um, no point of sale bars in that outdoor space. And um, uh, there is a question of whether we would allow any um, service uh, service bars in the, that area. I don't know if that's um, necessary, uh, but if so, those outdoor service uh, bars would have to um, be approved by SLA. And we would obviously assist in, in uh, drafting any corresponding uh, stipulations of operation, not only for, um, if they needed uh, the addition of, of such a uh, service bar, but also for that service area, because um, if this is a new service area outdoors, it would not be on their original SLA application, so that we would uh, we would assist in, in um, so, so that's, uh, that's probably a topic we would want to take up in discussion at some point. And again, just so folks understand the difference, a service bar would only be utilized by staff of the establishment. So the waitress or waiter would go to the service bar to get the drinks to then serve at the table. Um, it's not a bar where people, members of the public could go up for service. That's correct. Yes. That's, that's the difference between the two. Um, uh, the utilization of the outdoor space would be limited the hours of 8 a.m. to midnight with music only allowable with a valid music entertainment permit. Um, any amplified music would be limited to the hours of 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. unless part of a catered affair or part of a special event permit. And all music and noise levels have to comply with our noise statute um, in our town code, um, which we would um, remind everyone lowers the acceptable decibel levels between the hours of 7 p.m. or 7 a.m. So although um, amplified music can go till 9, it has to be at a much uh, lower volume once you hit the 7 p.m. That's, that's uh, currently what the regulations are for existing outdoor dining, correct? That's correct. That would just, we're just reiterating some of the existing. Um, so, uh, but I, I do think the uh, hours of operation for the outdoor dining is something the board also might want to focus on in, in this draft. I believe you wrote it in up till midnight, but that's, I think, uh, a topic of discussion. Sure. 
Um, we talked about the use of outdoor lighting pursuant to the section limited lighting consistent with our general lighting standards in our code um, and only allow exceptions when um, expressly authorized by a special event permit. So would, they would have to be night sky compliant. They must be um, designed, installed, and maintained to minimize the glare. They must be fully shielded. Uh, they cannot be visible beyond the boundary of the property. Um, and they obviously don't include um, up lighting, search lights, strobe lights, laser lights, any of those uh, blinking, pulsating, you no know, string I'll, lights. I'll see disco ball on that list. <laughs> <laughs> the disco balls. Um, also, uh, uh, something a little bit different than what we've done with the uh, kind of emergency uh, provisions, um, the string lighting, um, only because uh, there is a health and safety issue with that, that the fire marshal has been concerned about, um, not only on uh, um, uh, possible uh, um, uh, electrical issues, but also it's a, um, the stringing of those, that lighting, the, all the cords, tends to be a tripping hazard that he's been very concerned right. about. So we have um, that, uh, the sa health safety issues regarding outdoor lighting, make sure that it's conform conforming with the uh, fire and safety regulations. And then we have the town's own uh, dark skies, uh, outdoor lighting requirements, which this provision would require the applicant to, to be in uh, conformance with. That's correct. Um, also, one of his issues also was the use of any outdoor heating devices be fully compliant with um, the Uniform Fire Prevention Building Codes. Um, we would actually have the fire marshal prove anything and that those uh, the placement of those be included on any seating plans um, so that it'd be very clear how close they are to not only um, the actual um, seats themselves and the patrons, but any other um, um, items that may be out there. Um, so that uh, there aren't any any uh, potential health and safety issues. Um, similar to uh, what we've done for the outdoor spaces during um, the emergency provisions, um, use of tents, um, they're either temporary tents that are erected for less than a two week period, those go approved by the fire marshal. Otherwise they do need a um, building permit and those would go through um, the building department. Um, one of the provisions that's in here, but obviously needs more discussion, as you mentioned before, is, is if there is going to be uh, use of approved park, currently approved parking spaces for outdoor dining. Um, obviously, it would only be allowable if adequate alternative parking is available. Um, the board may want to be, um, whether or not they want to do that or, or be very clear um, what is um, adequate alternative parking um, and uh, how is that going to be determined? Or if, uh, if a um, applicant is actually interested in, in reconfiguring configuring their property so that the parking is used for outdoor dining, then perhaps it is a matter of them going back to site plan to get approval for a diff different parking area on their own property. But that's, that's part of this discussion or, or what needs to be further discussed. Um, we're talking about doing this uh, um, pilot program with a uh, application to the building inspector um, for the issuance of the special permit. Um, obviously with the, uh, the building inspector for health and safety and code, uh, fire code provisions um, already consults with the fire marshal, but it would be specific in here that um, she would consult with the fire marshal for uh, confirmation that the proposed outdoor seating area is consistent with health and safety concerns. Um, as I said before, it already has to have the, any heating would have to already be approved uh, for the, um, by the fire marshal. Um, the uh, building inspector would have to make following findings that uh, the proposed outdoor space for the site is clearly depicted on a survey or some similar rendering so that it's clearly identified on the property. Um, it has to be uh, compliant with the provisions of this section that there's adequate, adequate parking existing or proposed. Um, all submitted uh, seating plans are consistent with approved occupancy limits and indicate required egress and are clearly marked as to under what circumstances each plan would be utilized. Um, and any building permits necessary to effectuate the use of the proposed outdoor space would need to be submitted at that time as well. I think that was one of the issues that we found in the temporary is that uh, people got the um, properties got their um, 
uh, permit from the fire marshal and then went ahead and built structures in order to um, um, uh, complement that uh, use, but didn't go back to the building inspector to get um, um, uh, any kind of uh, building permits so that we wanna make sure that those are all done um, at the time that they're putting this application in. Um, some of the provisions that we put in here and why we looked at it as a, under the um, special permit is that we looked at the special permit could be revoked by the building inspector upon a conviction of a town code violation based upon allegations of non-compliance with the conditions upon which the special permit was issued. Um, it, it does says it's a conviction, but it's based upon allegations is the, the reason it sounds a little bit like doublespeak, but sometimes um, in, when you're in justice court, you take you accept a conviction under a different provision because it is a non-misdemeanor and then there are circumstances in which a non-misdemeanor is an appropriate um, plea to take. But the allegation, underlying allegations uh, for such a plea were based on, on violating the permit or the conditions of the permit. And we wanna make it clear that if you're not following provisions of this permit, regardless of what you pled to, that's, that could be the basis for revocation of the special permit. We did uh, carve out uh, no revocation be the result of a noise violation conviction unless the conviction results in the denial of a music entertainment permit. Since we've, uh, the board spent a great deal of time talking about what could um, bring about the denial of a music entertainment permit. And I know that's still uh, up for a, a uh, um, adoption or, or not with the uh, town board. We figured we wouldn't um, re-litigate re all of that again and uh, just uh, refer to that, uh, those sections. I know that um, a lot of businesses are very concerned about having um, permits and, and permissions pulled because of, of noise violations. So um, uh, kind of deferred to that uh, discussion, the previous discussion. Um, the use of the outdoor space um, pursuant to the special permit also has some provisions in here for allowing for suspension of the, of the use of this, uh, the area. I, um, and the three entities that I uh, um, have um, identified in here is the building inspector, the fire marshal, or the code compliance emergency preparedness coordinator, who currently is David Betts. Um, this, is sim this is language that's similar to what we have um, in a stop work order. There's reasonable grounds to believe that the use of such outdoor space is not in compliance with the conditions upon which this special permit was issued and such non-compliance is creating an unsafe or dangerous situation. It allows them to basically shut down that area until it is safe for it to be used. Um, some of that may be something that can be remedied immediately. Um, some may be much more, um, um, maybe more complicated on that, um, but it does, such as with the stop work order, require that uh, the notice be in writing and that also how to remedy it is also in writing. Um, and um, I've included language in there that, you know, if just because they have suspended, it doesn't mean they have to write a town code violation. However, if they're going to suspend for more than 24 hours, then they really should um, so that uh, the courts are involved in and there is some um, review at that point. Um, uh, so I think those are the general areas that those are the areas that I've, I've covered on this, obviously, where it goes in and, and what additional um, requirements. There's some that are already in special permits that I will just pick up and add to it um, that are, are would, would be in there as well. But uh, these seem to be um, the ones that that I found that were the areas of, of concern or areas of of uh, interest with regards to this um, um, pilot project. Okay. Any discussion questions for Nancy Lynn? Yeah, uh, it's just a couple points. Um, being out and about, I, I don't see many uh, establishments actually using their parking areas for um, uh, for dining right now. Which I, I think, it, if and God, God willing, we get past COVID right now, I don't think many establishments will continue to to do so. I, I think I've seen maybe not even two or three of them. Um, I, I wanted with. I like this pilot program. I like sort of where we're heading heading in this in this direction. I think we'll have to tinker it a couple a couple of ways. But if we do need to adopt this based on uh, the medical situation not changing for calendar year 2021, uh, will we be allowed to do so within the guidance of the of the state within this program? 
So you're you're asking whether or not there's any any reason that we wouldn't be able to adopt it because of of any of the uh, COVID. Um... Will we be able to amend it? Uh, you know, to put in social distancing markers in there. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah, you, you can always with, with if that's a um, anytime there is an an overlying state uh, regulation or requirement, an additional one. Um, those would automatically have to be um, adhered to as well. Yeah, so we even though, uh, for example, uh, currently restaurants have uh, their ability to do in in inside dining, but that has been limited by a state uh, requirement that uh, capacity be limited, and the town did not need to do any additional um, uh Code changes in order for that for them to continue to do their indoor dining, but at a reduced capacity. Thank you. And I say for me, the um, I guess it's the fifth bullet down. Such outdoor space must be located more than a hundred feet of the structure used for residential purposes. And then the second page, you know, top bullet: utilization of the outdoor space for dining is limited to the hours of eight a.m. and midnight. Um, to me, they're not, you know, they, they conflict because, you know, if I have, you know, even in a residential area, you could have a neighbor that's a hundred feet away and their voices can carry regardless of whether they have music on or not. So I think something has to give midnight, uh, might be too late. And I, I question if a hundred feet is enough of a buffer. Yeah. I, I agree with the, with the hours, Kathy and the hundred feet. Yeah, it's a point of beginning of discussion. I, I think also um, trying to decide if um, I'm, not, I'm not sure we would extend this for pre-existing non-conforming businesses in Arizona. I don't know that that would be allowable, uh, given that you know you're not allowed to expand those those businesses. So I would think that I don't know if you want to weigh in on this, Jeff, but I would think that that would prevent uh, the allowance of outdoor dining if they didn't already have it. But it's not a, it's not, I mean, that, that might not be an expansion of the use if they're using the same amount of occupancy, It'd just be a different area that they would do it in. Um, it's a good question. So does it, does it continue? I think the determination would have to be made whether or not the physical expansion of that use versus the actual use i mean indoor versus outdoor if you're going to take up more of the property is that considered an expansion under that section of code or not i think there might be some discussion about that um but i understand kathy's uh concern and you know i think we should certainly focus on ways to uh, mitigate impacts for between this activity and any other activity that's uh, not compatible so I, I wanted to ask if there's a restaurant that has approved landscaping plans, then can they remove the approved landscaping plans to accommodate outdoor dining? And without any approvals, it seems that this would allow that to happen. So I'm concerned that, that you know, they're, they're doing something that would normally take a site plan review. Well, that's one of the reasons to have this done by the building inspector, because if certain landscaping or many times the landscaping is, is shielding landscaping is a condition of um, it may be ZBA approval or maybe site plan approval. Obviously, that can't be changed um, in order to accommodate um, this special um, permit. So the, the building inspector is the one who knows of those conditions, would have that in the building record. And when they come in with their proposal, if this proposal somehow cancels out a condition that they're required to continue based on another approval, then they can't process it. Right. So um, that trumps um, the, the prior approval. Should, should, that should that be articulated then in the legislative I, I can certainly, and, that's how it will work, but I will definitely include uh, language in there on there. So if I think, um, I can't remember now who asked the question, but if you are, if you have enough space and I'm thinking more of some restaurants that might be within um, 
a hotel space if they want to um you know use other parts of their property that is not approved for outdoor dining do then do they still have to come in they just can't decide you know this is my pool area and i'm now going to make it into a restaurant i mean this is so this would be uh, a fear that some might have um how do we make sure that that it has to be in an area that is approved for dining which uh, certainly a parking lot isn't but we're letting that happen in this um pilot program. So, differentiate between what the emergency covid orders are and what what yeah. this would be this special permit which gives the town the ability and authority to pull it back if there are issues but um you know the, again it would allow for outdoor dining to take place on the premises it doesn't supersede a site plan that you know had a condition of a landscaping or something like that uh it may not in fact uh be that people everybody trying to take advantage of this would be able to do what they wanted to do without going back to site plan. Um, and I believe actually under our code, there is a site plan and there is the ability to request greater than 30%. Is that correct, Nancy Lynn? Through yes, there is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, currently under our outdoor dining, it's it, it allows for the the thirty percent to be moved outside, um, on on, and it doesn't specify um, where on the property. Um, it just has to be approved by the fire marshal um, as to the seating where that thirty percent would be um, utilized outside. If they want to do more than thirty percent, they do have to go back to site plan. Uh, to increase occupancy so um but if we in in those provisions we don't have any um uh limitations or requirements as to where that area is is placed by taking this and having it done by the building inspector there may there's it is less likely that the space that they are proposing is going to be in conflict with any other approvals or their site plan uses because the building inspector will have that site plan when she's um, reviewing their application to say, well, okay, well, that's a, a grassed area. They want to pursue it. Patio, that's a patio that you already have. have to, or, yeah. And if it is in conflict but, and they still want to pursue it, then they can do so through site plan. Yes, right. I guess I just need the triggers to go to site plan spelled out a little bit if, if okay. you're not. Um, and then, I mean, so uh, the alcohol bar issue, the service bar versus a walk-up bar outside um, is, is an issue for me. So I would not like to see outdoor bars, even though they're service bars at all. I'd like it all to be um, seated with, you know, service of alcohol, but it has to be, um, I don't think it needs, to be from an outside bar. So I would probably, and I, I think it would become a code enforcement nightmare, actually. Um, so I would probably remove that. I think we're doing fine without having it, um, having the bar outside, even though it's supposedly for point of not a point of sale. So I would like to not have that well, so provision we, in there. We do have we do have a few that that there are service bars that have been approved on site plans um and and perhaps um the only service bars that will be allowable are ones that they have been approved by site plan perhaps that's the way to delineate and so there, say there's that another um option to adjust the language of this so that service bars outdoor bars are prohibited unless you already have uh, site plan approval yeah. Whether they be whether they be service or otherwise, sure. I, I would agree with Sylvia on that. Um, I'm I'm a little concerned uh, about uh, what I've been reading about in Montauk on uh, the outbreaks of COVID among restaurant workers. I just want to throw that into the mix here. 
Well, that was going to be part of my liaison report, but go ahead. Uh, I, I just wanted to say it's it's a little concerning, and um, you know, I presume that this is motivated largely by COVID, so we can get restaurants operate, so they have a way to operate, which I, I understand. But I I just uh, I think I'd like to have a little caution light on whether it's appropriate to do a hundred percent or not. I've always felt that that it might be better to take this step by step and do it, you know, a little bit more incrementally. They currently can do a hundred percent outdoors. They can do a hundred percent outdoors, but again, that's a, you know, code enforcement nightmare to know who's got a hundred percent outdoors and who's got 50% indoors, or maybe they've now gone to a hundred percent outdoors and 50% indoors and you've increased your space. So well, it's also a nightmare for them because they lose their, there's a liquor license if they violate during time of COVID and as a special permit, they would lose their special permit. And the yeah, but this is, this is for dining. I'm really not talking about alcohol so much. I, I mean, one of the things, and this is in my liaison report that the, um, you know, two things from the Montauk CAC, outdoor dining was enjoyed by a lot of folks mm -hmm. and um, they would like to see the outdoor dining continue. Uh, the sidewalk dining in particular, uh, they were talking about, um, and it was, they think it was helpful in preventing people from packing themselves into, you know, a restaurant space. And the other side of the coin was there were several people saying they just don't want to see the capacity increased um, because of outdoor dining, that the septic system and, and the um, environmental influence of, of the density increase would could be devastating to the area. So, you know, so that's both, so this is, I think- Nothing in the legislation permits expansion of occupancy. It's, it's right. limited to existing. existing. Right, and I did, uh, cause we did talk about this, you know, this has been in the recovery group, um, business recovery group. We've discussed this several times that we're, you know, a draft would be presented to the town board and, and thank you Peter for pushing this along too, and Nancy Lynn for getting it done, um, you know, in such a quick manner. I really appreciate it. And so I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm, you know, I just want to be sure that we've, you know, done all the right things as we move through this. And uh, I, I, that's why I like these discussions. So yeah, that, that is the purpose. And, and again, as you said, it was uh, really came out of uh, the business recovery committee um discussions uh moving forward i think um we we all recognize that uh restaurants have been among the hardest hit businesses in our town and uh, many of the folks that uh work uh at them um you know are out of work or their incomes have been significantly reduced and i think generally everybody recognizes that outdoor dining is a much safer way to dine uh, during this time of COVID, um, and that through a pilot uh, program and special permit that significant safeguards can be put into place. And I think it's really helpful to have the discussion to fully vet among board members as to potential concerns. And we're just at the beginning of this. So, um, you know, this is our first blush um, I certainly would want to hear from the public as well, and we'll have opportunities to have further discussions and have, have the public weigh in. Uh, there is um, some interest to try to get this um, for potentially in place prior to the expiration of the emergency order, which uh, has designated November 1st. I mean, that could be extended by emergency order uh, potentially, but the board had agreed that to sunset that provision November 1st. I think there are businesses that are trying to plan ahead. Uh, we expect that more people will be in town uh, post summer than normal, uh, and that it would be an opportunity for some businesses to make up for some of the time they lost potentially, but they would also need to make some business decisions uh, whether or not they would need to purchase heaters and make other uh, you know, provisions, outdoor tables, whatever it is. So uh, with that in mind, um, again, generated by the Business Recovery uh, Committee, uh, this is the first uh, draft of what could be a potential pilot program. I just had just two last things. I, um, 
I know as we look outside, I don't, I don't know if anything addresses potential open flames like tiki torches. I know that they're not um, heating devices or such. I don't know if we should address this now as we potentially expand uh, the footprint outside. And well, David, those yeah. aren't allowed under under the building code. Um, the open flames. Um, okay. Aren't well, allowed. If we could just put that in there, also, you know, yeah. it's, it's more specifically, it'd be great. And the last one also is just uh, make sure that uh, uh, even though we we might uh, might allow for expansion out, outside, is that to uh, at least on the facility, either inside or outside, or or, or whatever the percentage, you know, they're gonna uh, that the restaurant owner is gonna pull out that they at least have one table that would be ADA accessible and to, and to make sure that we comply with that. Good point, David. Um, so my, my really the last comment was on lighting and um, I, I, so this legislation would, they could be over what they're allowed on their um, site plan as far as the amount of lighting and that you know how they uh, uh, there is a grid that they use that they make sure that the lighting is at zero at the property lines. Although this says it's not across boundaries, but there still would be additional lighting needed for outdoor dining. So and it isn't on their approved site plan. So the my main and and you need to have some sort of lighting outdoors. I'm not uh, debating that, but I think I would lower the um, Calvin temperature to 2000 instead of three, which is now allowed. I just think that if you use those, it's even if you can't see the bulb, even if you, um, you know, go by, they're not blinking or flashing or, you know, it's still a really bright light that I would lower that Calvin temperature. Okay. In the pilot program. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know about 2000. Uh, I mean, our town code says 3,000, but... Yeah, uh, it's still a very bright light, even at 2,000. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but, I, I you know, we certainly could I, see... I know who to call. <laughs> we all know who to call. We certainly need guidance on, on that. Oh, so, so I know who to call for guidance, yes. <laughs> Good. One other issue is... Um, um, I know you referenced the pilot program, Montauk um, Outdoor Dining, that, that uh, uh, we attempted a few years ago. Um, that legislation and, and that code is, that program actually is still alive because uh, although no one ever applied for it, we did not include any sunset uh, um, or time limitation in that legislation. That. Oops. Um, so this pilot program, um, we should have either a sunset date or a, a language that, that determines when it would be reviewed, either to be um, uh, uh, discontinued or, um, you know, whether it needs to be um, re-upped in order to make some changes and test it some more, or to then, uh, or the third alternative always being to make it part of a permanent um, part of our, our code. So um, the appropriate way to do on a pilot program is to start off your pilot program with a, a date in which you're going to, um, at which it, it would sunset unless one of those three things happened. So um, that's one of the issues that we're not quite yet having to have that number now, but um, something for everyone to think about um, when, you, when you think it's, it will have, will it need a season or two seasons, in order to really have a, a sense of um, its um, usefulness or its appropriateness, um, I, that's that's just out there. To yeah, I think, I think that's appropriate to have a, a sunset, maybe a one year period of time. And then at the end of that period, it could either be extended for an additional period of time, discontinued or codified, you know, permanent. Yeah, or changed. I mean, at this point. Yeah. We may want to say this worked, but this didn't. And this one, one more year. So I, I yeah, I, I think that's a good good way to go. Is there any way, since nobody did the outdoor dining under the old pilot program, is there any way to pull that pro pilot program? Since yeah, it, yeah the, the town board can certainly just uh, revoke those provisions. Okay, because it, it, it got very complicated with the um, 
the forms that everybody had to fill out more so than we wanted, but every, you know, it, 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 um, you know, for whatever reason, it just didn't work out. So um, I, I would be in favor of just dropping it, <laughs> actually. One of the things that we've, we're, and we, you may want to do that, like I said, um, you may actually, you know, to kind of clean up the code and, and have less um, uh, overlapping provisions. Um, like I said, our outdoor dining section may at some point, it may be good to merge these together. It may be also good when you're implementing this one to um, remove that one so it doesn't look like that one's still out there and be confusing for, for those who are not not necessarily familiar with the history of outdoor dining here in, in the town. Um, so those are all, all definitely um, possible things to do. Also to help, as you said, with you know the application process, one of the things, once I have a better grasp of what we're looking to do on this, is to um, uh, propose some um, what what the application would look like, um, what the you know a notice would be for a suspension notice would look like, so that the actual paperwork that would go along with it um, would be something that people could see and get a sense. Um, you know, we're not looking to make people go out and get a new survey, but we need something for our, our building inspector to be able to look at and go, okay, so you mean here on your property, you know, just saying, plan to do it on the deck. Okay, you've got three decks, give us a clue. So, you know, get have an actual area that can be highlighted, agreed upon, that goes with the permit so that anyone coming on, on site uh, or uh, if they've been called there by code enforcement or PD or anybody would be able to easily see where that is supposed to be. Okay. Any other questions, uh, comments at this point? We certainly, uh, again, this is our first blush and cogitate on it a while. And, uh, you know, the public uh, will now become aware of the discussion. And, and uh, in fact, we have one new caller right now as I speak. I don't know if it's regarding this topic or not, uh, but I'll, I'll move to the caller then. Uh, if board members don't have any other comments at this time. And thank you, Nancy Lynn, for preparing this uh, for us to review and discuss. Yeah, thanks. Michael, do you have a caller on the line? I do. I will unmute that caller right now. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. I always like to let you guys know that pe some people have staying power and, and uh, appreciate the hours that you put in and uh, the time it takes to help run this town. Uh, this is David Buda. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, David. I did have Thanks one. Put in. I did want to make a comment or an observation. I missed the first 20 some odd minutes of the meeting, so I don't know what was going on, but I did happen to catch what unfortunately I have to label as the uh, all time low point of town board uh, meeting history. Uh, you came very close, uh, Mr. Supervisor, to causing the board meeting to devolve to the level of the gong show. Uh, <laughs> never should a council person who's elected by the populace, one of the five equally powerful members of the town legislative body, be cut off in mid-sentence from presenting what he feels is an important uh, topic. All five of you have equal power to voice your opinions, and all residents want to hear equally from the five of you. I have to commend uh, Kathy for bringing you back to your senses and allowing Councilman Bragman to finish his thoughts, to express his views, and then for all of you, after having heard all of the um, opinions, make your decision. David, so that's I, my uh, I could comment just, for the day. I could just interrupt you and just thank you for pointing that out. Um, and and frankly, um, I, I think I let my emotion get the better of me of that. And uh, I also want to thank Kathy Burke Gonzalez for reining that back in. Uh, that was the right thing to do, and uh, I just was caught up with what I thought was going to be a filibuster rather than uh, a fruitful discussion of uh, of the topic. But uh, thank you for pointing that out, David, and I and I don't disagree with your assessment. Well, that's very big of you, and I appreciate that. 
and uh, I hope you all continue to have uh, collegial exchanges of opinions for the betterment, betterment of the entire town. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Do we have any other callers on the line? We do have one more caller. Just a moment. I'll unmute that caller right now. Um, hello? Hi. Who's calling, please? Um, Deb Foster. Hi. Good afternoon, Deb. Hey, Peter. Hi. Good afternoon, Deb. Um, I would like to address the um, granting of an easement on Beach Lane. But before I do that, I want to compliment the board on not eating lunch yet, and unless you snuck it by me, um, and uh, and dealing with issues that are so important to everybody, from you know alternate energy to uh, business people's concerns. Really, I'm very impressed. Okay, the easement. Um, I've been involved in this for about two years, and I, I do my homework like you guys do. And after months of meetings and hundreds of hours, <clears throat> the settlement discussions uh, with Orsted and Everstores are, are starting to come to a close. Um, but I thought it was a great process. People were able to uh, make their comments about things that were pretty complicated. I learned some good things. And we also had experts there from uh, PSEG, PSEG Long Island, LIPA, um, Department of Public Services, Natural Resources. It was, it was really uh, very interesting. I must say, once you put all those comments together and have all the interveners and the professionals make comments, it's about seven inches tall. So this has already been a very extensive experience. But let me talk about the easements and get real for a second. <clears throat> the applicants, um, deep water, came up with Two easements. You probably know this, but I just want to review it for the uh, audience. One was, of course, um, Beach Lane. The other one uh, was to come in at Montauk and then go down uh, Route 27, essentially the main streets of Amagansett and East Hampton Village, and um, that brings along as you can imagine, its own problems. So I went, and with a little bit of my planning experience, uh, dug into some files and read some of our code. And um, the Citizens for the Preservation of Boynston, to their credit, hired some professional people, and they had their own alternatives. There's a problem, a serious problem, with all of those alternatives that would stop it literally right in its tracks. Well, first of all, you know this, that uh, the, the beach lane access is about four miles, and the Montauk accesses are about 12 miles. So it would take, instead of one year, if we did their recommendations up near Montauk and Napier, it would take two years, and it probably could cost twice as much for uh, Mr. Mahoney, who was concerned about the cost to the ratepayers. Uh, another thing that I researched is our code. And our code makes it very clear that nothing, no structure above or below ground can be messing with our primary zooms. So once you go to Montauk, guess the first place you have to go through. It's Napied and those huge primary dunes right up through Amagansett. So on its face, it's, it says in our code, can't do it. However, 
at Beach Lane, the irony is the lane itself is, I don't know when it was built, but it it destroyed the primary dune at the end of it. So you're not really going under a primary dune. Um, Napig is referred to in our comp plan as one of the most fragile areas of our entire town. And as you know, we have very fragile natural resources. It actually is two feet below seawater. And so what's saving it? The primary dunes. Um, the idea is that you're supposed to go along the railroad, but in walking that and talking with uh, an engineer, there is not room in their easement to come in with uh, the materials that you would need without disturbing the wetlands. The wetlands hang very close to the railroad tracks. Um, so that right away would make us think that that's a serious problem. I mean, some of it is owned by New York State. It's a preserve. The uh, citizens for the preservation of Wayne State did come in with another alternative that was coming up into Amagansett and suggested the substation uh, they built another substation, and that that's where it would then start uh, going along the railroad tracks and then to Cove Hollow. Um, the problem with that is when you look at the map that they provided, it's not going up to the parking area for many reasons. It's going smack through a very tall, high dune, and then all on beach land for about, I'd say, 100, 110 yards according to what the physical education teacher paid. Can I, can I just make a, so interrupt that, Deb for a second? Um, yeah. I just want to make sure yeah. that we Who stay that? within the, um, we're not discussing anything that was discussed during the settlement agreements and that it, this is, everything that she's discussing this, is this public was, information. Good point. This yeah, is I just not want to short, you're an intervener. There are certain, it, uh, certain issues in the settlement that we you know, have to stay within uh, that boundary in that public format. Well, this is, so, uh, so, fine, uh, I'll do whatever you want. But I just want to say, to clarify, this is stuff that I've written down myself from our codes. This is not discuss, right. discussions at the settlement. So. Well, we appreciate those comments, uh, Deb, and uh, I'm not surprised that you would be aware of, of that in the code since uh, during your time in service to the town, you uh, were instrumental in protecting a lot of those dune areas from, from being obliterated by development. So thank you for that. One other thing that I just is a, is a fact um, that I've researched and did not know. Who would know that in all of the earth that the northeast of the United States has the most consistent wind, consistent, not necessarily the strength of it. And that's why they decided to have a black island, kind of a see how it would go, and then decided on East Hampton. They didn't start down in Florida and come up. So our, our, there's a concern about our winds in summer. Our winds are very consistent throughout the year, better than just about any other place. Okay, I'm done. And I do want to clarify, thanks for bringing it up. Uh, this was not settlement talk. This is my talk from my background and doing some research. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Good luck. Deb, for taking the time to call us and comment. Get some lunch before you pass out, my lord. Okay, take care. It's it's always easy to tell when I'm getting hyperglycemic. Uh, do we have any other callers on the line? No, we do not. There are no more. Okay. In that case, I know we had I had placed uh, South Fork Wind Farm on the agenda. Uh, as a placeholder, uh, not being certain as to whether or not we'd have additional documents to release and discuss, and as, as we do not, um, I think we can move on to liaison reports. Uh, 
Uh, we have. Heard can I can I ask a question though? With that, I mean, does, I don't know if John has any indication on when we would get all the documents, and then once we do have everything and have an opportunity to post them so that the public can have access. Um, I think it would make sense for us. I know we're by statute, we don't need a public hearing. I think it would be helpful if we had a dedicated special meeting just to hear public comment on the community host agreement in easements, like kind of meetings we used to do for the airport. Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was my intention to schedule a public meeting as we have in the past for this particular topic. Um, and as soon as we have, uh, you know, an opportunity to present the public with all the documents, then we can start thinking about when that public hearing might be scheduled. So, John, I guess, is, is there any indication on when we're going to have all of the documents? Well, we're negotiating with, with the deep water folks still, so. Um, I, can, I can say, I mean, you know, the board's aware that there, there's really only one outstanding topic that we're uh, trying to resolve, and it's just a matter of language back and forth on the agreement, and uh, that's ongoing. Uh, but I, I do think that that will be resolved uh, sometime very soon. I just don't know when. And I think it'll be right? But I, I, that'll be circulated to the board as soon as we reach that point, right? And then to the subsequently to the public. Okay, um, well, in that case, again, liaison reports. Sure, have... um, just start with the, anyone that's in need of assistance from human services, they're available uh, eight to four, uh, Monday through Friday. They can be reached at 631-329-6939. Um, to date, they have, from since we shut down on March 10th through September 11th, we have distributed over 33,000 meals. Uh, we continue to make our weekly wellness calls and also pick up um, essentials that seniors need from the grocery store, prescriptions, and, and other things. Um, I'm going to have a, a resolution on for Thursday for a budget modification for fourth quarter for our senior nutrition program. As you recall, back in June, Diane came to the work session and presented uh, the monies that she was going to need in order to be able to provide uh, meals um, for the third quarter. And now we're looking at the monies that we're going to need um, for fourth quarter. So, um, and that should take us through, obviously through the rest of the year because um, we're twice the number of meals that we normally serve just during COVID. Uh, we also got some good news. Um, Suffolk County Office for the Aging uh, amended our contract for this year uh, for our senior nutrition program. And we were granted um, an additional $147,450, which is uh, we will use, you know, four meals for our 60 uh, plus population due to COVID. Um, this was completely unexpected and uh, we're very grateful that the county uh, took a look and, you know, I get they're aware of the program and, and the services that we're providing right now. And the other beauty of it is that it's going to offset the revenues that we won't be collecting because our programs, you know, are not being able to run right now. Our, we're not, we don't have our in-home services where um, folks from human services go in and help uh, people with, you know, cleaning their home or, you know, shopping or, uh, preparing meals. We're not using, uh, running our residential repair program where, where we have uh, a maintenance mechanic go into someone's home and, you know, clean gutters on, you know, one-story homes or put in safety bars and, and air conditioners and things like that, or the adult daycare program. So we're, we're missing out on that financing, that those revenues, and this is going to more than offset that. So that was uh, tremendous news as well. Uh, just wanted to give an update on the Springs Fireplace Road Reconstruction Project. Everyone knows it's a county project, $7.6 million, um, and it starts at, you know, North Main Street and goes up to Woodbine, and they are making steady progress. Uh, right now, the installation of the curbs and the sidewalks continue. 
Uh, they're also going to be uh, putting in a retaining wall just uh, north of where the bus depot is going to be and the East Hampton Golf Club. So that's some, a project that they still, uh, I was told that they were holding off on that, but Steve Lynch tells me this morning that it looks like they were starting it today. Uh, they're placing topsoil between the curbs and the sidewalk all the way along um, Springs Fireplace Road, and they're discussing, still discussing the landscaping. Um, and a question was asked last week when we had the consultants in for the corridor study, if you recall, Bob Pine asked about the curbing along that area, and Ray Bias responded that it um, that almost all of the curbing is mountable, which is what the community wanted, um, either a concrete curb or an asphalt tip-up gutter. Uh, the tip-up gutters are used north of Abraham's Path and mountable concrete curbs are south of Abraham's Path, but there are isolated areas where non-mountable curbs are needed um, to direct you know, the flow of uh, runoff and whatnot. We've, I also noticed last night that uh, some of the, um, that the Safe Routes to School project has started to mobilize. Folks remember that started while we went for the grant in 2013. I was still on the Springs School Board. And that's a, a sidewalk on the west side of Springs Fireplace Road from Woodbine up to Gardner's Avenue. And then they're going to be um, realigning the intersection there to make it safer for kids that are crossing that need to cross to go to school. Because in Springs, if you live less than a mile from the school, you don't get bus service. So there's a lot of walkers in that area. And then once the Safe Routes to School project is complete, the, the Town Highway Department, Steve Lynch is gonna be uh, embarking on a paving of Springs Fireplace Road. I think I brought this up a couple of months ago. It goes from Woodbine to just north of Barnes, the old Barnes Deli. He's looking to mill the road to lower it a bit and reprofile the road to, to move the water differently up there because at there's times when there's storms and uh, high tide with Pussy's Pond, there's, there's you know, overflow and flooding in that area. Uh, it was mentioned earlier when Gordian and Lauren were on that the Spring CAC meets tonight, which is at seven o'clock on Zoom um, and uh, Gordian and Lauren will be there to discuss DCA um, as a run up to our public hearing on it um, this Thursday at 11. Uh, special events I brought up last week, we had gotten an application from the Hamptons International Film Festival that they were looking to do a drive in at two locations. One was Atlantic uh, Avenue Beach in the back parking lot and the other was a private residence on Buckskill Road. Um, so we had gotten input from Dr. Polsky that they he had suggested 50% capacity in every other parking space. So I went back to the applicant and they had submitted uh, new plans and went before the, the event committee. So um, for instance, at Buckskill, they re requested 76 cars uh, down from 100 cars, which was the regular, the, the original uh, application, and the committee approved the 76 cars as they were diagrammed. For Atlantic Avenue, they requested 72 cars, and the committee approved it with 70 cars. It turns out there were two cars in the southeast corner over by the comfort station that would have blocked, um, wouldn't give a given uh, emergency vehicles the ability to make a turn if they, if, you know, if that was so needed. So um, the chief fire marshal thought that, you know, removing those two cars would make it, you know, safer. So it's for five nights, Thursday, October 8th through Monday, October 12th, 5 to 10 p.m. They're showing one feature film at each site. The rain dates are Tuesday. October 13th and Wednesday, October 14th. And um, there'll be a resolution on for Thursday because of the, uh, because of the application, it's normally 250 people trigger a town board resolution. But if you look at this cumulatively, um, I think it's best if we have an app, uh, a resolution. So that's, that'll be on for Thursday. Um, and we've also part of what the uh, committee had asked for was that we get 
uh, contact with the security company they're working with. So the East Hampton Town Police Department could speak to them and, and, and work all of that out. Uh, they've guaranteed at least eight, you know, uh, parking attendants and uh, we're going back and forth on the number of security guards. So um, I think it'll be, um, you know, a, a safe and enjoyable event um, for, for everyone. We also got an application from I Try. They do a, this is their third annual Hampton Ride and Wine fundraiser. And they're looking to do it Saturday, October 10th with the rain date of the 11th, eight to three, 100 to 150 riders. They're doing a 10 mile course, which does not come through East Hampton, but their 30 mile uh, course does. It's not a timed race. They're looking to have a water table uh, in East Hampton. Uh, and they, they need to get back to us on that location. Um, but the committee was comfortable with the application and uh, this particular application, because of the number of participants, doesn't require a town board resolution. But I just thought, since it's the first, you know, road event that we're, um, the committee is permitting uh, during COVID, I figured I'd bring it to everybody's attention. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to bring up um, what we're doing on the census. If you don't mind, I'll share the screen. Let's see, share. Okay, so um, We've done it in an effort, you know, due to the fact that we're so underrepresented versus uh, 2010, that the board had agreed that we would, um, you know, make an effort to get our community members and residents to respond to the census. So we're doing it within our campaign for the health of our community, respond to the census by September 30th. So we've got quarter page newspaper ads that'll run this week and next in the East Hampton Star, East Hampton and South Hampton Press and the Sag Harbor Express. And we've, uh, we're done, we've done it in English and Spanish and we're giving the phone number that people can call as well as the website address. We've also uh, done first class postcards. We're mailing them to 19,000 uh, homeowners. Uh, and again, English and Spanish um, for the health of our community. Um, and then on the back of the, of the postcard is, you know, um, a little story it tells you it'll take less than 10 minutes to complete and emphasizes, you know, how critical it is and the, the need for folks to do it. Um, we're also going to be uh, having placement on our town's uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter feeds. I, I don't have the graphics yet. Um, there, I'll have that in a day or so. Um, we are going to be boosting posts though on Instagram and Facebook. On Instagram, it'll be a carousel um, with the English and Spanish versions. And on Facebook, we're going to be boosting separate posts, uh, one in English and one in Spanish. Our budget for that is $500. And then lastly, uh, Berlin Rosen uh, worked up a flyer for us that is um, downloadable. Uh, it's eight and a half by 11, um, and uh, which is like the benefit of working with them is that we've gotten a great deal of graphics out of them. They did the newspaper ads, the flyers, the postcards and whatnot as part of their, their monthly fee. Um, so I've had some folks when we sent out the, uh, Peter from your office, when you had sent out the press release about the, um, uh, you know, about the campaign that we were running, uh, a number of people had reached out to me and asked for uh, the flyer. So I've been sending out actually both flyers. We have a flyer for the, for the, for the main campaign for the health of our community, um, wear a mask and stay six feet apart. And now we've got a census flyer as well. And I think what I'm going to ask Gabriella to do is, today too is send those flyers out to all employees so that staff can put them in their departments and put them on the, you know, we should have them as you enter our building. So that's the, the, the next step. But, um, you know, and I mentioned last week that there's also going to be a caravan um, that Ola is involved with. Unfortunately, it's this Thursday and we've got a town board meeting, but um, their, their line is let's drive our census numbers up. So, um, 
hopefully, you know, if anybody's listening out there, go to my2020census.gov, takes less than 10 minutes and, and please respond to the census. And that's what I have for today. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, David, are you available to give us the uh, uh, liaison report? I, I am. Okay. Yes, I am. Uh, the Nature Preserve Committee uh, met last week. Uh, they were going over our trail maintenance report. Uh, Andy Gates uh, informed us that uh, some of the maintenance that they've done uh, for Tambar Creek to the bridge and cutting back some of the trail in that area um, of East Hampton. Uh, they, in they installed some wood duck blinds, wood duck boxes, excuse me, on some areas, uh, actually up in Scoy Pond also to see uh, how that native bird is going to be uh, used. Uh, Fresh Pond and Scoy Pond are two of the locations. They also removed a bunch of encroachments onto town property. Uh, discussion came up about uh, southern pine beetle. Uh, there's no recent cutting on town properties. They have one or two inspections on private properties. But overall, the events and the actions that the town board had taken a couple of years ago are having a very good result right now. Uh, there was discussion about Buckskill Meadows and how we can move forward with that management plan with uh, the multi-user trails. And uh, we'll be, uh, hopefully I can bring that up to the four board discussion uh, next month. Also, we reviewed uh, two management plans. One is for the IR property, which is at 81 Ocean Avenue, which is on uh, in the East Hampton Village. That property we discussed in uh, a town board work session about doing a restoration plan on there. I just received it. I'll forward it on to the town board for review. Uh, maybe we could discuss again in a work session and then hopefully schedule for a public hearing for its adoption shortly. We also discussed uh, the Maloney property. I mentioned this again in the past. It's a property that's on Akabonic Harbor that the town had purchased, removed the house, but there was a large stance of bamboo on it. Uh, the, the committee and myself uh, included want to take some action about uh, coming up with uh, some uh, process in which we can try to eventually hopefully eradicate that bamboo stance. And I'll have some more information for the board to discuss. We did not discuss the 555 management plan because we are awaiting a soil sample still uh, for that plan, but that plan is getting closer to completion and again, we'll bring that to the board then. Um, we discussed the tar works uh, area, which is out in um, Montauk, uh, about restoring it to a native grassland. Again, this is the area uh, that's on uh, the part of the Palmanoc Path. Um, and lastly, we discussed that Kirk's Place, which is in the Grace Estate, where there's some invasive barberry. So the Nature Preserve Committee is discussing uh, invasive removals, also about what we could potentially do for uh, uh, assistance on decreasing uh, ticks on some of our properties then too. Um, in aquaculture, um, in, in, in accordance with um, Conic Estuaries Program's recommendations for actions to be taken uh, based on the scallop die-off last year, uh, part of their action plan was to set up a controlled setting for scallop growth uh, and see how it, that works with predication. Uh, specific actions that we are going to take to see uh, about predication of local scallops that were uh, discussed from uh, by cow nose rays, which eats vast quantities of local bay scallops, which I think I showed a picture. They're now being seen in some of our local uh, harbors, Akabonic, Brimo Harbor, where they weren't seen last year, but there was a good set of scallops in those areas. Um, the Peconic Estuary Program recommended that we actually would put nets out around some of our scallop sets. So groups of scallops will be deployed. Uh, this is coming from um, John, um, John Dunn, our head of department uh, of the department. Uh, we deployed in pearl nets suspended from the surface, uh, thus protecting the, uh, from predators, but not harmful algae uh, growths. Uh, if it is a factor again this year, the parasite that was discovered last year will die, uh, kill them off, not necessarily predication. Uh, this isn't necessarily the most comprehensive way uh, to uh, go about this, but should be work the best we can with that, within our timing of the growing season. Uh, ideally, we would like to also, uh, also have free plant scalps in the same area and monitor both in contained and free planted scalps, yep, uh, scalps on a bi-weekly or monthly basis 
to compare uh, to compare the treatments. Uh, by chance, if there is a catastrophic lo loss of the scalp industry, industry again this year, uh, hopefully we can formalize uh, this work for next year, secure some funding to do it, uh, do it differently uh, um, and in a little bit more of a vast area than we're planning to do in just in a couple of small locations. Uh, the aquaculture department did do uh, a very similar project and through 2008 to 2013, um, uh, they, uh, where they seeded the sanctuaries and monitored survival uh, along with the gonad index and stack collection. During that project, there were no protected uh, animals uh, in that, so uh, animals being the scouts, uh, so that would be an add-on. Uh, also, in other news, uh, in the aquaculture department, the growing season is coming to an end. Um, the growing season is coming to an end. It's a, it's a different, hey girls, daddy's on the phone. Uh, it's uh, coming to an end, it's, it's, a different, it's a different year uh, due to staffing matters and growing. Uh, and production issues at the ha uh, uh, based on growing production issues at the hatchery level in the spring. Um, the department's output of numbers will be much lower this year for oysters based on those production issues at the hatchery, uh, about the same as usual for clams and way up for scallops. So uh, we've salvaged the season uh, with a different production Hi, profile. <laughs> Come on. Uh, we will be start, uh, the aquaculture department is going to start seeding next month. Um, and have the field, field season wrapped up by November. Uh, the CPF Advisory Committee did meet. Uh, very thankful uh, for all those committee members to go about uh, the business as committee members visiting the properties. We did so in Zoom. I just want to say a thank you to them. Also, uh, the, the Beach Advisory Group is going to convene uh, through Zoom and have our exit meeting about all the actions uh, that we that, uh, saw the beaches over this course of this summer season and others. Uh, one thing I want to let the, the public know is that this is the last weekend of lifeguarded beaches. After that, all the beaches will not be uh, And I think we've lost your connection, David. So this is the last weekend of uh, lifeguarded beaches, and today and yesterday there was high high surf warnings and and rip current uh, warnings as well. So we again uh, asked folks only to swim in guarded areas due to the uh, the threat of rip currents. So uh, at this point we'll move on. Uh, Sylvia, do you have a liaison report for us? You're muted, Sylvia. You're muted, Sylvia. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, I know David will come back because I know he wasn't finished with his report. Um, so the business recovery group met on Wednesday. Again, we heard um, reports from Robert Ross about COVID in, at the hospitals. There were none as of last Wednesday in Southampton or Eastern Long Island. There were 14 at Stony Brook. Um, as of yesterday, though, I heard there were two people now at Southampton Hospital. Um, we talked about testing moving from the Montauk School to the East Hampton High School. And again, you need to make an appointment if you want to use this testing. The um, number is 631-688-3705. 668. Did I say? Oh, sorry. 688. <laughs> No. Six, six, eight. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Thirty-seven oh five. So let's do that again. Six six eight three seven oh five. Area code six three one. Um, we discussed the Montauk Chamber is over Columbus Day going to do a two-day farmers market and a virtual clam chowder contest. I think you have to go on their website to get all the information. Uh, um, and all the business types from, biz from people that were doing building to uh, office use to restaurants are looking for um, upgrading ventilation systems as cooler weather arrives and offices and restaurants want to be able to provide safe environments. So um, I did have the name of one person that is local and sent that to all of the business recovery groups for them to make contact themselves. Uh, let's see. And then we talked about the legislation to continue some outdoor dining. So I don't need to go into that since we had a long discussion today. 
uh, the Antibias Task Force met, the um, Diversity Show, um, the latest one was hosted by Audrey Gaines and Anna Steck with uh, Chief Mike Tracy. Uh, they, this is their second show. They did it with Talia Hayes and Anna Hoffman, and you can view it on LTV, and it's also available on YouTube. Um, I will be able to send that link to the town board members, and I can put that link up on our website as well. It was a very well done um, interview, questions and answers, and very proud of these young women um, as citizens of not only just East Hampton, but citizens of the world. Um, let's see, they are looking for new members. Uh, they wanna you know, continue their diversity shows as they are able to do. And um, they've been distributing the census material that we had from OLA, so we keep sending that out. One of our members has an English as a second language school that she's put together. So she's also been distributing um, that information. So the Energy Sustainability Committee um, meets uh, once a week as a small group uh, and they're talking about Car Free Day Long Island. I don't know, Peter, if you're gonna talk about that again in your liaison report. Oh, you, you can talk about it if you like. Okay, so it's, uh, it's Friday, September 25th. If you would please just go to Car Free Day Long Island and go to that website you can then pledge that you will try to be as car free as possible. Things like, um, you know, combining errands or carpooling, walking, riding your bike, all of these things um, you can check as a list of things you will try to do on car free day. And uh, according to how many people sign up is how, what kind of, um, award the town will get. Last year we reached a bronze level, so hopefully we can reach a higher level this year. And uh, so please go to that website and it just takes two minutes just to, to sign it. When you get to the landing page, it'll say on the right hand side, pledge, and it'll say how many people have already signed up and just hit that and you'll get your own little link to pledge. The last couple of years, I've ridden my bicycle to work. Uh, not sure I'll do that this year. Uh, COVID's made it even easier to not use a car and I can remote in and not even ride a bicycle tomorrow. Yeah. So telecommuting is one of the things that they talk about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the Montauk CAC met last night. Uh, we had a lot of people on the Zoom call, so it was good to see everyone again, especially at the end of the season. And sidewalk dining, uh, the comments were it was a big hit. Uh, another comment was it was lovely to see um, the sidewalk dining that seemed like a resort community and that that's what they meant by it was lovely to see. Um, and I did talk about the town board considering legislation to continue the sidewalk, uh, the outdoor dining. There was the concern about the increase in seating capacity, which of course this legislation does not allow. Um, but they were concerned that it be in the legislation. And um, it could be a real test for the code and fire marshals. And so those were just some of the comments from the pub, from the Montauk CAC about it. Uh, they did talk about um, COVID testing and again, talked about the site being moved and they were still happy to see that East Hampton has a site that they can go to. Um, there was a concern about people, this is in Fort Pond Bay. Uh, the number of people that were on boats, large boats, the number of boats that were in Fort Pond Bay and the loud music that went with them and that people could hear it um, well inland. And, uh, and they wanted to know if it can be stopped. So um, we'll, we'll have to, I, I haven't talked to Ed Michaels about it. I might, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll have further conversation with Ed. There was the longest discussion was about the condition of the beaches. I've had conversations with Ed Michaels, with David Lease, and with Tony Littman. There was a photo that went around showing a East Hampton Town truck picking up um, all of the containers after um, after Labor Day. So it was Labor Day Tuesday. There must have been 50 metal containers on this truck. And I can send it around to the other board members if you'd like to see. One, congratulations, Tony Lippman, for getting his crew out there and picking everything up so quickly. 
Uh, the other is it was disturbing that 50 containers plus were left on the beach. Um, he felt that most of them were left kind of in that commercial area of downtown Montauk. Sylvia, did you say 5 0 I said 5, 50? yeah. If you should, I will send you the, the, the photo. I saw a picture of the truck, but, you know, they stack, so it's hard to tell how many are in there. So they counted over 50? No, they didn't. They said it looked like. Oh. So, right. so, no, they did not count. Um, so they feel that these beach fires are a problem. Uh, parties from share houses seem to be in one section of the Montauk Beach is uh, a big problem and that they all leave debris behind and how can we manage the, the garbage and debris left behind with the, um, and how to manage the beach fires. So they put a subcommittee together to discuss the ideas and they're gonna send them, David, I, I see he went off screen immediately. <laughs> David, come back. Um, they're gonna, back. They're gonna send, um, you their ideas and some of their after they get together they know about the beach advisory committee and they're um one of the people on this committee is dick monahan who i'm sure you've worked with before um as he's been an ocean um lifeguard and ocean volunteer ocean lifeguard and uh, fireman at the um montauk fire department so you know i think he'll be able to bring along with the other people that volunteered to be on this subcommittee so appreciate that thank you yeah so i just and again um uh you know in talking with ed michaels about it, it it's a challenge to get the marine patrol he may for next year um you know s do some of the different scheduling uh for the marine patrol to be on the beaches at different times so that was um my my outcome with with his talk uh, a conversation with him so that is all i have for today Thank you, Sylvia. Jeff? Uh, I met with the Airport Management Advisory Committee, and um, leases seemed to be on their mind. Um, we were discussing if any leases were in default, and um, I had spoken to Jameson about that, and, and there, aren't, there aren't really many, and reported back to them. Um, it's, a, it's an issue that keeps sort of recycling with them. They again asked for lease forms, which I believe we have previously sent to them. I spoke to Jameson again about it, and um, we agreed that, that we could forward on a couple of leases or a few leases that are public record and available. Anyway, um, they raised again the issue of getting a form lease, um, if there was like a template that the town was using but I have to have further discussions with Jameson about that. Was um, there any particular concern, Jeff, that they raised over leases or form no. leases? No. It's just not a form lease or any kind they, of- they, they actually want to help. That, that, their attitude is we've got people that know- It was something that they had identified that we should know about. No, no, it's not, it's not that they've identified a problem. They, they'd like to be able to go over them and see um, if there is sort of a template um, and try to, um, I guess there are a couple lawyers on AMAC and a few others that know airport leases well, and they just wanted to uh, see if they could help out and tighten the leases up or, or offer any suggestions. I, it seems constructive. I, I don't see any problem with it. Jamison, uh, I think, was willing to um, give them uh, documents that are in the public record and I, I believe had previously done that. So but it seems you know issues kind of fade and then they come back and that seemed to be uh, a relatively hot topic. Um, Can I ask if, is this something Jameson has asked to have help with? Is there anybody that- no, I don't think the town attorney's office would ask AMAC for help. This is just AMAC uh, volunteering to be good citizens, I guess you could call it. No, I guess, okay, so they're trying to advise us. Yeah, they'd like to advise you, give us help. Uh, you know, I, I personally, leases are kind of difficult to do uh, if, if they have any good ideas. Uh, let them, let's see if they have any good ideas, I guess would be my, my take on the situation. Um, there was some talk about uh, traffic, you know, air traffic and the numbers. Uh, Jim Brundage uh, brought in uh, his director's report, which I think I have here. 
And um, he compared August 2020 to August 2019. And in terms of total traffic, there's been a pretty significant drop from 7754, 7754 operations to 4678, 4678. And he's broken them up uh, by uh, aircraft type. There's been a dr really dramatic drop in, in uh, helicopter traffic from 2,486 operations to 753. So that's the category that took the largest, uh, experienced the largest drop. Um, piston planes are, uh, I'm not sure that he had a comparison on pistons. Can you um, forward that to us, Jeff? Yeah, I can That'd do that great. Thank you. as soon as I finish talking about it. Um, and uh, uh, jets are also, uh, down not quite as dramatically from 1326 total operations to 1097. Um, but Jim has noted that the jet traffic seems to be the larger corporate jets, um, which means that they're buying more fuel, which somewhat offsets the loss in, in, in revenue that would otherwise occur. Turboprops are down almost by half from, 19, uh, from 2019 uh, 1,961 uh, operations to 881 operations. Um, and seaplanes also have a very dramatic drop from 1,105 operations to 334 operations. Um, so, and then we have comparative figures from July as well. Total operations uh, from 2019 were 7,109. Uh, for 2020, 4416. So that's quite a significant drop. And helicopters in July, it's kind of shocking, really, dropped from 2,357 operations July of 2019 to 71 operations in July of 2020. Um, and uh, turbo turbojets, I'm uh, sorry, turboprops. Um, hmm, I don't see the uh oh i i see uh jets are down 27 percent. i don't have the actual number of operations and um seaplanes are down 67 percent. so overall the traffic is way down um between you know now and 2019 although uh a couple of the um uh people who do not support aviation reminded us that if you add up the totals, it's still a lot of, there's still a lot of traffic coming in and out if you just take the total number of operations. Have um, you done a report for the number of noise complaints just for July and August versus 2020 versus 2019? I do not have that. I can ask him for that. Okay, so plane noise should give you a monthly report on at least just with plane noise, if we just did that. Yeah. Um, okay. You should be able I'll, to I'll talk to Jim about it and we'll, we'll get okay. it out. All right. I don't have the total number of complaints. Because some of those, as I looked at the complaints on Tuesday after Labor Day, I think there was over 350 complaints in just yeah. one day. Yeah, so, I was looking at them and saw a very large number too. It was, sounds yeah. like the same one yeah. I was looking okay. at. Which was is yeah. 152 complaints just yesterday. Yeah. Uh, and then. I, there are more complaints about piston planes too, which is probably okay. predictable. Well, I just, I just um, it, regardless of the aircraft, I'd love to know what the complaints are. Um, I will circle back to you. Right? And what, Jeff, when does the tower uh, close? Well, the tower's not, oh, oh, the tower, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. The Air tower. traffic control tower. Yeah. I don't know the date that it's gonna close. I thought you meant the, the uh, terminal. Um, so I'll circle back to you on that. Um, they wanted to see the, they wanted information from HMMH. Um, so I'm gonna send them the PowerPoint that, that we discussed in a, in a work session. They wanna take a look at it. So that should um, be posted on the website too. I, I mean, thought I it was, I asked him and he said he wasn't sure whether it was or not. I, I asked yeah. him if it was, I'll check back with him again. Um, and then, oh, they, they're, happy that we're getting some activity on the rental signs and asked if we could post 
the sm smaller rental signs, like on the doors or in some visible place of the terminal, even though the terminal's not open, which we can do. We have these little, uh, pl you know, plastic in case signs. So if the board is agreeable, I don't see any reason not to put a couple of those up as well. Those are I'm fine with that. There. Right here. As long as you don't use the space where we're <laughs> charging rent for people to hang their advertisements, right? No, I think we could put a couple signs up that aren't going to yeah. interfere. Um, they're again talking about um, re reviewing and revising our FBO standards, the fixed based operator standards. Uh, and they're kind of, you know, in the middle of uh, examining an airport that's fairly comparable to ours, which is Truckee which is the Lake Tahoe airport. It has a similar kind of mix. So there, that's an ongoing, uh, an ongoing project with them. Yeah, I think those minimum standards haven't been updated since the seventies. Yes. Yeah. And they're apparently that is still a project that, that they're looking at. Um, that really is about it for uh, AMAC. And then um, Wayne Scott uh, CAC met and uh, you know, kind of predictively, the big issues for Wayne Scott CAC are the airport, uh, to maybe, maybe to the greater extent, um, the granting of the easements and the and the host community agreement on, uh, the, on the proposed wind farm was the subject of a conversation, um, as well as um, the airport. They again, some of the folks that appeared at AMAC reappeared. Um, at uh, the CAC meeting and, you know, reminded us that um, the the total number of flights between July, uh, July and August was, uh, not flights, operations between July and August this year was 9,094, which is quite a bit of traffic even in, in a slow time. And, you know, they raised the issue that it's not really, it's not only noise, it's also, you know, carbon footprint and you know there were some comments about how much fuel uh, especially the larger jets burn especially on takeoffs um and that that does you know pose a serious uh impact on our uh on our carbon footprint uh, which they would like um examined um and they reminded us that at its busiest times khto is busier with traffic per hour than even large airports like LaGuardia, which I've, I've heard before, and I know that that is a fact. There are times that we are busier. More planes are coming in and out than in LaGuardia. Um, we also talked there about um, the wind farm. I would say there were opinions on both sides. Uh, no surprises there. Uh, we talked about uh, the Wayne Scott Green. They'd like to see it happen as quickly as possible. No surprises there. They've got a tree that they want to characterize your comments to the Wayne Scott CAC uh, regarding the town board and Wayne Scott Green because I think it would be important yeah, I, to hear how you characterize that before that group. Yeah, I said it had been slow going with the town board, a bit slow going, and I referred to the fact that it took a long time to get the size of the sign resolved, which I thought was kind of an, a non-issue. And that recently I had submitted some additional wording on the sign with no changes to the sign and uh, was basically waiting to get answers. It took, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks. And I finally got a request for a mock-up of the sign, which we have now produced. And that uh, it seemed a little, it seemed a little slow going on the signs. On behalf of and uh, I explained to them who, who has to make the request. One of us had to make the request before you could get a mock up. Well, Sylvia, we had already approved the sign. All they were adding was letter one lettered sentence, which we sent you as a sketch. We sent a sketch, not a mock up. Really but, but we had, like, hang, hang on, excuse me. Let, let me just finish this. I, I know you want to get in a fight here, so I, let me you know, I tell Jeff, I, I just want to avoid future fights because when you say things like you said at the Wayne Scott CAC, you know, that pretty much uh, makes your fellow colleagues on edge and then they react like they did today, where when you poke us and you try and say that we're acting nefariously when we work so hard at what we do, 
It just it, here you go it, again, it Peter. Fun. Here you go again. I wasn't suggesting anything nefarious, and I wasn't suggesting you know that you weren't working. I was disagreeing on a legal point about how we handle an environmental review. And, and we're talking you know, about what you got green now. Here you go again. Here you go again. No, I just no, think I, I wanted I thought it was important for the board to hear because the way you characterize that to the Wayne Scott CAC was the only reason that this really isn't done is because the town board's been dragging their feet on this. Oh no, I Peter. Just, no, no, no. Don't don't put words in my mouth because I have my notes have right in, right in front of me. I have my notes and I have the phrase that I used. I said it had been slow going and I referred to the sign issue. And Sylvia, to your point, you know, here's here's what I would like to say. We it took it took us, I believe, three different work sessions to resolve the size of the sign that the board wanted, which I thought was a little uh you know, overly attentive to the size. The eventual decision was we wanted it to look just like the Duck Creek sign, which is fine. The only other, other than the town board, the only other entity that has a real interest in that sign is the Friends of Georgia Capon, because they, they're contributors that help create the Wayne Scott Green. And so fair about, at this point, it's probably three weeks ago or more, uh, Sarah Davison, uh, I asked Sarah, you know, as you know, um, the, the town board also agreed that we would memorialize uh, Rick Del Mastro, um, you know, as have the park honor Rick Del Mastro as a memorial. So the chairman of the CAC and Sarah got together and wrote a sentence that would be inserted into the sign we had already approved. And, and frankly, I thought the only real issue on that was the content of that sentence. It wasn't the way it was gonna look. It was gonna be lettered the same way. The size was the same. The size, the sign was the same size. And I was you know, a little bit surprised that I didn't get a response from anybody for about 10 days. And then thereafter, Peter asked, for a mock-up, which we've done. And uh, if it hasn't been distributed, it will be distributed. I think it was distributed. But the point is, it was a very small issue of just adding some lettering that said the Rick Del Mastro Memorial Park. And then why don't like you, a simple, why don't you simple, describe simple what you said about the parking lot and the paving. Why don't you tell us about that? The parking lot and the paving, I said we... Um, are you talking about uh, the paving materials, Peter? All, all, the whole process, because you talked about all, a lot of things there. Do you recall what you said about that? Yeah, I said the parking lot, well, there are, two, there are two different issues on the parking lot. One was the money and whether it would be where it would be paid for. Now, originally, uh, Peter, you said in a work session and also in front of the Wayne Scott CAC that it would be paid for with general funds. You were willing to pay for it with general funds. Actually, I didn't say general funds. I said with uh, sur uh, surplus. Yeah. Surplus, I'm sorry. I said it could be paid for with surplus. That yeah, we, would surplus. Figure out a, we would figure out an appropriate funding line. Well, in the time that, that elapsed, uh, when we were ready to begin the work, and then there was a bit of an issue about what the parking would be paved with, what, what kind of surface the parking would have. We had to do asphalt for a handicap accessible space. And then the question is, what, what did you want to do with the other space? I went to Steve Lynch. He had a plan for how to surface uh, the other spaces. At that point, Peter, you suggested that we have the spaces be just grass parking. Just let them be grass for a while and see how it works. I went back to Steve Lynch. And he, he just said, it's not going to work. Um, they're they're going to get torn up and muddy, and they're just not going to be functional. Right. Well, the so, original number of parking spaces in the plan that you presented to us with oil and stone would have been an impervious surface, and it would have been, I think it was eight uh, parking spaces in total and at least six. And my suggestion was rather than pave a, a parking lot taking up that much space in the park that we should have it pervious surface and perhaps grass 
And then subsequent to that, uh, the discussion was about putting in uh, stabilized space with gravel. Correct. Right. Well, no, yeah, but before, yes, correct. And so it, I it, think, it, I guess my point is right. these, these conversations occurred really recently and, um, you know. Not that recently. They, were, they occurred after Steve Lynch was basically, had presented a plan for construction. Um, so, so that's, I mean, that, that's, oh, and, and then we did talk about the funding issue because, you know, at the time Steve was ready to basically launch, which he is, um, you know, he wanted to know what funding line the payment should come from. And at that point, um, I think comments by uh, Scott Wilson had been sort of forgotten because Scott, about a year ago or more, uh, indicated that it could be that we could use CC, uh, that we could use uh, preservation funds, CPF funds, uh, for the path for a passive recreation path. Well, that, but at the time we were talking about funding lines after Steve Lynch was ready to roll, seemingly that wasn't uh, in anybody's memory particularly. So we were discussing whether we could use CPF funds or whether we could not use CPF funds. Um, to sort of cut through the, you know, the question, because it's a legal question, I did some research of our regulations, and my reading of it was that we could use CPF funds. Um, I then confirmed that with uh, Fred Thiel, actually. I went to Fred and just said, you know, what do you think? Um, and I think at that point, I handed around the memo. Peter, you agreed with me that it could be CPF funds. And at that point, I thought we were ready to roll, but... Uh, Scott said we have to amend the uh, uh, preservation and management plan. plan, the master plan, yeah, which we did. The process. And the only and the only wrinkle in that was, in, you know, in an attempt to get get it moving more quickly, um, I went to Len Bernard and asked him, you know, as a matter a matter of budgeting, uh, whether there was a workaround on that. That we is, was there a way that we could begin the work, you know lawfully and, and manage it with in, in any different way. And Len suggested a, uh, a budget uh, modification resolution. And his rationale was that, you know, if we could allocate the funds, the work would begin. It was very likely, and we could in parallel, we could uh, uh, submit the motion to amend the management and stewardship plan, hold the public hearing, and that the chances were very good that we wouldn't even have to use general funds because by the time the work is done and invoiced and reviewed, the management plan would be amended. I asked Peter, you, I asked if we could do that. You, uh, d you, you did not want to do that. And so that brings us up to the present moment, which is we're waiting for the public hearing on the modification of the management and stewardship plan, which unfortunately means we're gonna to have to keep it open for at least a week uh, after we get um, a transcript because of the COVID regulations. So that's where we're at. We're probably, you know, if we had, if we had not taken that route, if we had done the budget modification, we'd be constructing that. But well, we'd still have to do the budget modification on the meeting. And yeah, I but we, we, could be, we could be constructed. I, I frankly think that would have been a, a better decision and, uh, I personally think this thing could I did, be I didn't want summer. To sixty. I didn't want to take sixty-seven. I also think I need a Snickers bar. <laughs> I didn't want to take sixty-seven plus thousand dollars out of surplus for this one. It, it's an eligible cost under CPF, and I think it sets a bad precedent mm -hmm. to float uh, and then have that fund repay the general fund. I just think, uh, for all the history that that you know we've had in this town, that that's doesn't look good on the balance sheet, but in any case, um, you know, things take a long time to move forward. Um, you know, I, I know that you're, you're rushing to get this done. Uh, and I can appreciate that, you know, at this point, having been so long that we would, we all expected that it would have been, uh, completed. That was the purpose originally for handing it off to the liaison yourself because the, uh, the original idea was that the Nature Preserve Committee uh, would 
would take it up and that because of their meeting schedule that it would take much longer to get it started. And originally we're trying to get it done for summer of 2019. But in any case, I'm, I'm glad that um, it looks like we're getting closer every day. Yeah, we, I, I also left out, you know, it was, it was David's suggestion actually, uh, you know, to, to, to move the telephone pole, which is actually supposed to be a later phase of the project. But we, so at one point, you know, very close to the time that Steve Lynch was ready to construct, we, you know, corresponded and got that set up. It was very expensive, as you know, because I forwarded um, the, uh, the the cost to you. And, you know, it just seemed like there was no point in doing it now. It, it was scheduled to come later and it was a lot of money. So, so there were, you know, there were other tasks that had to be done, but it looks like we're nearing, uh, you know, the end of, of the line. Once we can close that public hearing, uh, Steve Lynch has told me that he, you know, he could, he predicts that it could be done within a, a couple of weeks. And I think it would be a good thing for the community. I know everybody here uh, remembers Rick. Um, he was quite a memorable uh, character. He was, he was a very good friend to me. And, um, you know, he was an unusual man. He was a guy, I, I say it about very few people, but he's a man, uh, he was, you know, getting up there in years, but I feel like I never saw Rick Del Mastro grow old. He was never old. He had a very youthful uh, style, a unique style. And, and yet he had that maturity in a meeting. He could really settle people down and offer advice. And um, it, it's rare that you find a person like that in a meeting because uh, he could keep things moving and get and, and bring people together. So I'm part of the reason that I'm in a, in, in a rush is because, you know, I knew Rick, I knew his wife, we had drinks together and he was a good friend. And I know the community is eager yeah. to, uh, it, you know, we, we all knew Rick and, and we admired him and we, we miss him sorely. Um, you know, I, in, in terms of moving forward, we'll have a public hearing, uh, I would, I would think we could prove it the same uh, uh, once the once the transcripts printed, whatever within a week. Uh, that puts us on the first meeting in October. Um, at the same time, you know, you have to follow up and make sure that the contractors lined up to do the work with Steve, and that the voucher and everything's all in order, ready to go. So yeah. concur I would suggest that you work concurrently rather than wait for the next step to happen to schedule the yeah. work. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm already on to that. I have to be out in front of that a little bit. So I, we I, I, closed out by a weather issue. I know. I know. Um, there was also discussion uh, by the Friends of Georgia Capond. Sarah Davison gave a little brief report. They did use the harvester. I know there's been some, you know, thought that long-term they should come up with a, a different management plan, but uh, they, uh, they got permission from the DEC to use the harvester and it, it has uh, improved water quality this season, which is uh, really good news in Georgica. And the blue crab uh, crop is you know really good. In fact, they're trying to keep people out that are harvesting them um, illegally. And uh, you know they've made some significant progress on replacing septic systems. They've, they've replaced 23 of them and they're planning to replace 12 more, which is a good thing. And as you know, they have a project to control surface water runoff from the rest stop. So um, it was a good report and kind of good to hear after we've had last, last summer was really uh, the water quality on, on these ponds was very, very poor and, and kind of uh, scary. Uh, they're, they're interested in hearing more about the airport revisioning. I could tell them that we're meeting with consultants and we're in the, uh, the stages of trying to structure that, um, uh, that review and couldn't really tell them any more of that. And um, we had a few of the um, uh, more outspoken airport critics there. I've already kind of uh, told you about what the, the general uh, gist of their uh, objections are, and um, it was a fairly, uh, I would say it was a fairly low-key meeting all in all. That's about all I have from Wayne Scott CAC. Okay, thank you, Jeff. That it for your report? That's it, yes, thank you. 
So I just wanted to update uh, the public and the board on the COVID related cases. The last um, report I have is for September 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th, the daily average of positives of those tested was 1% still, seemed to be flattened out right at that 1%, a little bit of fluctuation above and below, but again, it comes back to average exactly 1% over those four days. Um, as Sylvia mentioned earlier, um, there are two cases currently of uh, COVID within Southampton Hospital. That's rather recent, um, but I should also note that neither one of those cases is in ICU or intubated. Um, you know, we know uh, several weeks ago, a couple of um, restaurant workers tested positive for COVID. Uh, two of them uh, lived in the same household. Uh, the businesses uh, shut down, tested all their employees, and did deep cleaning. I think it's really important and interesting to note that um, from what I'm told, there were no, uh, there was no transmission from those workers within the restaurant to the other workers, um, which means that those restaurants were following the protocols and that they actually worked. Uh, I think that's important to note. Uh, I know there is probably some ongoing um, contact tracing just to find out and make sure that there aren't any other outside cases from patrons. But I think it, it emphasizes uh, two things. So one is that this disease is not going away, uh, that it's still here in the community. That um, And by the way, two of those uh, restaurant people were asymptomatic positive. So um, even though you might be feeling well, uh, does not mean you don't have the disease and are transmitting it to others. So you know, I think it's really important that we continue to follow those safety protocols, keep wearing the masks, keep uh, being diligent about disinfecting uh, commonly used surfaces and washing your hands regularly. These are the most effective steps that we can take ongoing to protect the health of ourselves and the health of our community. Um, so I would just urge everybody to just keep at it. We're not done yet. Um, We've been very fortunate to have a general public that's been very receptive to the guidance that we've been giving from the various earliest days of the pandemic. Um, you know, we, we can do what we can do uh, to inform the public, but without the public's cooperation uh, and community support, uh, we wouldn't be where we are right now, which I think is in a really good place. We managed to get through the summer and make the very best of it that we could under the circumstances. Uh, and again, I think I've stated this before, uh, you know, many businesses uh, did struggle, especially at first. Um, some businesses are reporting the very best season they've ever had as a result, and others uh, have had very, very difficult times. Uh, and, you know, so we need to continue to be cognizant of that. Uh, there has been, a, uh, I think, a slight a bit of up, uh, let up in uh, maybe the number of people coming in for assistance, uh, food pantries, but it's still, the numbers are very high uh, and we expect that'll continue and it may uh, jump back up again in the coming weeks uh, due to the seasonal nature of our town. Uh, some of those businesses may be closing and not staying open as we move forward. The town property management committee meeting yesterday, uh, uh, centered around a number of town properties. Um, first of all, Springs Library. Um, there was some discussion about that. Uh, we do have uh, the need for some restoration work on that building. We got a, um, a report from Drew Bennett, an engineering study. Um, but also outside, uh, there was a tree that we uh, recently took down. I don't know if you can see that on the screen. Are you able to see the share, screen share? Yes. Yeah, so this is the, there was a very large tree just outside the building, not far from the roof. Uh, this was the inside of it, it was completely hollow. It was only supported by about one inch, half of that is bark. Um, and it was threatening uh, the building. We did have um, an arborist, trained arborist assist uh, with a, 
a uh, recommendation and they, they felt that it really needed to be taken down. It was taken down. We are now at a point where I think we can move forward with the roof replacement and some of the siding on the structure. Uh, the roof is really deteriorated to the point where uh, weather getting in will become a concern. We did get uh, on contract uh, price. I think the total was 113,000, uh, but we can circulate that. Uh, that included a new cedar roof and uh, some siding, other repairs uh, to stabilize that structure. Um, the property management committee also uh, discussed briefly uh, the phase three restoration of second house. Phase two is just nearing completion. I know David has been involved uh, directly with that. Uh, the building's looking great. The exterior was returned to the um, layout and configuration of the, the last keeper's cottage, which uh, dates back to 18, I believe 95, when uh, at that point, Kennedy family purchased it and converted it into a summer home, add dormers and made other interior changes, including adding an elevator. So that, that part of the restoration is nearly complete. Uh, phase three would include um, doing the mechanicals in the building, uh, as well as interior finishes. And I know, David, you're pursuing uh, the possibility that perhaps some of the um, mechanical work could be done in-house uh, to save time and money. But uh, we expect that that third phase will move forward uh, fairly soon, hopefully concurrently with completion phase two. Um, it's a rather big project and uh, potentially could be finished by summer 21, next summer, uh, if everything moves along well. Um, Can I ask a question, Peter? Sure. The Springs Library, I know um, we had it in the capital plan. I believe it was for $200,000. This quote that we got, we got from a, um, someone on contract comes you know, well below that. Did, I don't recall, did we bond for that or do we still have to bond for that? I thought we had bonded. My, my recollection, and I haven't looked at it um, in quite a while now, I thought it was like $265,000 that we had bonded for that structure, but we can go back and, and check. So yeah, because if we haven't, it would be great to get it on ASAP so we could get that work done. Yeah, I'd like to get the roof done immediately. That's yeah. what I'm saying. It's the, we have the bid back uh, to do the work, and it's just a matter of uh, authorizing uh, that work. So I, I would uh, look for that um, resolution coming up first meeting in October. Uh, so let's see, where was I? There was a discussion about uh, Boys Girls Harbor Pavilion siting, originally Boys and Girls Harbor Mess Hall, uh, which was a rather large structure on the former Duke property on a 57 acre preserve. We We've looked at the Various town boards over the years have looked at renovating it, having a other outside organization come in and, and kind of manage it. Uh, none of that came to fruition. The building uh, fell into disrepair. The board authorized the demolition of the existing structure with the idea of replacing it with a smaller uh, pavilion uh, because that parkland with that amenity uh, would be very helpful to have bathrooms and uh, you know covered shelter. Um, and I think that because of where it was originally cited that the town property management committee really was only focused on that location. But since there's been a full demolition uh, of that original building, um, I suggested that perhaps um, putting the structure closer to the roadway of Springs, uh, Springing Banks Road, where the existing basketball court and parking and large field are, and all the, a number of trailheads, that, that seemed to make more sense for a number of reasons. One of the concerns that I've heard from the neighbors is that um, because the existing, the previous structure was so far from the road uh, and, uh, and isolated, that um, there were activities that occurred there um, that uh, were not desirable. Uh, we certainly saw that with the 
uh, the graffiti and vandalism that occurred to the structure there. Um, so, uh, you know, the property management committee has been taking that issue up to, to look to see if uh, that doesn't make much more sense. Uh, it also would make the electric run for that structure considerably less. Uh, again, it also separates out the public and pi private spaces a little bit better than what uh, would happen if it was rebuilt on the original mess hall site. Uh, I so that we was the, saving uh, the uh, I thought we were saving the, the chimney, didn't we? Save yeah, the chimney was retained and uh, it was uh, Tony Littman um, had parts uh, close off the, the mouth of that fireplace so that nobody would be able to use it. Um, for now, I, I do think retaining it uh, as a, a, a landmark of what was there, um, you know, is is important. I think uh, I think you agreed that retaining the chimney was um, uh, important to do, just as as a acknowledgement of what was there. So, um, ongoing discussions on that. Um, the budget uh, is nearing completion. I've been reviewing departmental budget requests, and I expect to have uh, the uh, draft budget released to you, um, perhaps by the end of next week, but certainly no later than September 30th. Um, things are shaping up pretty well, and I, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that we can deliver a budget that uh, that is both uh, re reflective of our, our values and uh, what's important and uh, one that is um, conservative in terms of how we spend the taxpayer dollars. Uh, we've had obviously a lot more uh, expenses due to COVID. Our revenues this year are, uh, are off what they normally would be. So between the additional costs and, and lost revenue uh, this year, um, I don't expect we'll be putting aside any additional surplus, but because we've done so uh, consistently for many years, um, we are able to weather this and uh, again, retain during the time of COVID, we've managed to retain our, our AAA bond rating. So I think, uh, I think you'll be pleased with what's, what's uh, released and you'll have an opportunity to either uh, request additions uh, or subtractions uh, in that amount. There's not going to be a great deal of uh, tax cap space. I, I am hoping to get it in under the 2% tax cap. A number of other communities are finding that extremely difficult to do. Not impossible, but I think, I think there's a chance we can get there. Um, Jeff mentioned the George Pond Steering Committee. Uh, there is a, a um, and Jeff mentioned the, the rest area. There is a grant that the Friends of Georgica have received from Suffolk County to do water quality improvements at that location. The, um, the town and George Capon, uh, Friends of Georgica, uh, discussed working on a uh, memorandum of understanding between the two parties and that we would uh, match the grant of Suffolk County uh, in the interim and that's being worked on, John, I believe uh, your office is putting together that MOU and that is, um, I guess, nearing completion. And um, so once uh, we have that, uh, we'll look at authorizing that. But uh, I did also want to reach out because there have been some changes that have occurred. I got a phone call from uh, the Connick Land Trust uh, about uh, the property Il Molino, the restaurant there at the head of George Pond. And that's a property the town has been interested in trying to acquire with uh, CPF funds for a number of years. Uh, well, it was back on the market and uh, at a price, I think, higher than, than we could pay uh, based on appraisals that we had. Conic uh, Land Trust had uh, an individual step forward, buy the property and donate it to Conic Land Trust. And um, in my conversations with John Halsey, I asked whether or not uh, 
there would be the possibility of having a water quality improvement project placed on that property because there's a lot more upland and ability to facilitate uh, water treatment, road runoff primarily at that location than at the rest stop. The rest stops is very constrained size wise. And uh, the question came up as to whether or not the Suffolk County grant uh, if it was still eligible uh, for that. So I had a conversation with uh, Director uh, Sarah Lansdale, Suffolk County Planning, and, and she said, yes, there was flexibility in that to uh, accommodate uh, that additional property. So I think those are um, exciting developments. And John, as soon as you can get that MOU circulated to the town board members, uh, we can have a discussion about it and uh, see about moving forward. Um, let's see. Uh, Jeff also mentioned in the report about uh, septic improvements. There have been 23 systems, low nitrogen <laughs> systems now uh, installed around uh, George Pond. Uh, this is really good news because while they have used the harvester this year in an emergency permit, uh, long term certainly trying to reduce the inputs of nitrogen uh, will also have a significant impact on reducing algal blooms. Um, so to all those who have taken that step, uh, we thank you. And uh, there really have been quite a few um, uh, documents coming across my desk to sign authorizing rebates. So people are start really starting to take advantage of this. I would encourage uh, second homeowners who might be watching who would only use their house in the summer if they're staying out here longer term to consider putting in a low nitrogen system. Uh, there are significant rebates to cover the cost of that. And due to the increased use of your home, increased nitrogen will be entering our ground and groundwater, uh, which can have uh, really deleterious effects on our surface waters and groundwater. Uh, so this is a way that we can all ensure that our environment and our public health uh, is maintained. Um, I, I have uh, re repeatedly pressed to get additional assistance uh, and testing out here in East Hampton from the very first of part of the pandemic. Uh, testing was completely unavailable. Uh, the first testing site and the only testing site in Suffolk County for uh, the early days of the pandemic was uh, Stony Brook University Hospital. Obviously that's a considerable distance away from us here. And as uh, more and more testing became available, there were more opportunities. We were able to um, bring testing to uh, Pantago, um, actually right on the site of the future uh, emergency uh, satellite emergency center. Uh, a pop-up testing site uh, with Hudson River Healthcare for a period of time, uh, Southampton Hospital. When that, uh, in that period of time expired, Southampton Hospital then came in and we were able to help facilitate testing uh, by them out in Montauk during the summer season in advance of the summer season throughout the summer. Now that schools um, started again, there was a need to have testing more centrally located for um, because of the schools opening, teachers, students, uh, and everyone else in town who might need testing locally. But the capacity to test is, is still uh, pretty limited. And I repeatedly asked uh, the county uh, to be able to dedicate some of that $257 million in CARES funding uh, to the town. To date, they've not released any of that funding to towns which they are able to do. Uh, and rather than just plug their budget gaps, I think there's a responsibility, especially in a public health crisis, to uh, have some of those funds available to us here in East Hampton. And uh, I've been joined in my plea and cry and uh, uh, by the uh, Suffolk County Supervisors Association who have, have also made that, uh, that request. Um, we will continue to press for, for more testing capability here, especially as we are forced to move back indoors. It becomes even more critical. Uh, I think 
all uh, all can agree that more testing um, really is a very important tool to know uh, how the disease is spreading and uh, how to avoid this, the further spread once you identify cases. And many times there are asymptomatic cases. Um, and I think, I think that's it for my, my liaison report. So at this time, we've already done resolutions. Any other comments by board members before we move on to the next phase? I'll yeah. take a motion to go into executive session then. Um, and if we could reconvene at 430, does that sound good folks? We have a very long executive session. We really session do. Agenda. And I just so everybody knows, I have a seven o'clock CAC meeting. Last week we got out at seven o'clock, so. Well, we could, uh, we could just continue uh, offline and exec and just, uh, I just want to give people an opportunity to eat. My, yeah. my sandwich is sitting on my desk. <laughs> Um, I, I want to give others. My mac and cheese has gotten cold. <laughs> you know, my sandwich is cold too, but. My tuna is warm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm having. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to just start at four then? Um, 4 15. I'll send out a link. 4 15. Yeah, 4 15. That's doable. 4 15. Okay. Great. I can turn it around. We're going to go to exec session at 4 15 for contracts, litigation, and personnel. Second. All favor? Aye. 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 Pass and carry. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. Stay